Okay, folks. It's Friday. We're behind the eight ball already in terms of timing. We have some beautifully uniformed folks that are going to speak with us very shortly. Um, I'm sure Mr. Traves will be there. What's that? <laughs> well, yeah, the chief doesn't speak shortly, that's true. Yeah, he didn't hear me. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're good to go. This is our budget meeting. This is budget meeting number 1,622 of the year. I welcome everybody to it. It's March the, oh, it's March now, eh? Hang on a second now. It's St. David's Day, isn't it, today? Yes. Yeah, it's St. Listen, as somebody that um, has Welsh background, I wish everybody a happy St. David's Day. Get your leeks and your uh, Welsh, oh, I love Welsh cakes. Yeah, somebody usually sends me some. If they're listening, I, I love them. I want to call this meeting to order. I want to acknowledge we're in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional, the unsurrendered land of the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, we uh, honor the peace and friendship treaties that have been signed on this land. Um, before we begin, uh, we received the word last night that uh, uh, Brian Mulroney, Mr. Mulroney, passed away yesterday. As a former prime minister of this country and one that was consequential, and uh, I can speak as somebody that w wasn't always on the same page with him, but I don't think there have been many uh, Canadians that I, that I would respect more than Brian Mulroney. And uh, he's had a remarkable life. And I wonder if we might just take a uh, stand for a moment of silence for Mr. Mulroney and his family. Wish him well. Thank you, folks. David, did you ever meet him? Yes, I did. You want to say a word? You you must have. You want to have a word? You want to say about Mr. Mulroney before we begin our meeting? Well, as you said, he's quite a statesman. He's been known for a lot of national but international things. But he was also very a very personal gentleman. I met him back on. My younger days, some of the PC Youth Conventions when I used to go to Ottawa or when he'd come to Halifax for the national, for our annual meetings here. But uh, he has always been a gentleman and a scholar, but uh, he'll be missed. And uh, his birthday would have been uh, in three weeks' time, March 20th, so he would have been 85. So I guess the Irish eyes be smiling everywhere for him. So thank you very much. Thank you. We have no minutes uh, to approve. Uh, the approval of the order of business, if somebody wants to move that. Moved by Councillor Lovelace, seconded by Councillor Kent. All in favor? That's done. Uh, conflicts of interest, colleagues? Seeing none. We'll move to public participation. We have two people who have signed up. Um, two people that have signed up, I think, are relatively well known to council. And we'll hear from them and then we'll see if anybody else wants to join us. The first is Mr. Brendan Marr. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Members of Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. As, uh, as many of you are entering, uh, well, as you're all entering the final year of your, of your term in Council, I want to thank you all for the work that you've done with FIRE and uh, the support that you've given. We've seen, we've seen a lot of growth under, uh, under um, your leadership and, and your support of the service, and um, I'm hoping that that growth uh, can continue. Um, 
and I want to thank all of you that took my calls, emails, and, uh, and met with me to discuss issues. Um, right now, uh, in Halifax Fire, we are playing a game of catch up uh, with service delivery. Uh, we have a deficit that um, we need to have a steady approach toward if we're going to overcome, catch up and overcome our deficit. Um, our city continues to grow, uh, urban, our urban growth vertically and more people in the city means it's harder for us to get around the city and, and we're slower uh, within the urban core. Um, and we have suburban and rural growth into the wildland interface, which creates uh, significant risk uh, for the members of the communities. Um, uh, as a fire service, we ha presently have the capability uh, to train uh, 20 firefighters in a recruit training session effectively. Um, due to extreme heat in the summer and extreme cold in the winter, uh, when we hire in the spring and fall, we can effectively train 40 firefighters per year. Um, with the growth that we're experiencing, um, I believe we need a consistent approach to catch up to service deficits and be where we need to be as plan developments come. So. Uh, I am hoping that today a uh, member of council will be willing to move to amend the proposed fire budget to add a fall 2024 hiring uh, to help us to keep from falling behind whenever we miss our opportunities to um, hire, build and procure apparatus. We, we deepen a deficit that becomes harder to catch up to and the burden moves on to future councils and future fire administrators and service providers. Um, right now, we have um, 80 members or more of our service that have started their careers in 1996 or later, or 97 or later. Um, over 50 members of our, of our union were hired before amalgamation, which means we're, we're going to experience significant uh, succession and retirement and the need to higher um, is, is, is pressing. Uh, a missed opportunity will have, uh, will have consequences and a future impact. Um, in synergy with that, uh, the way that our systems are working to coordinate uh, the hiring of staff with the preparation of buildings to house those staff is not functioning properly. Um, it may not be the role of the budget committee to correct that, but you need to be aware that right now, it's a year since you approved staffing uh, for Middle Muscadabit. We have hired the recruits there in training and work has not started at that building yet. We need, we need to fix this problem. I know that you'll all be away from the, the table and budget deliberations and look into that. It needs to be addressed. And, um, and I, uh, I trust that you will look into that. Um, yeah, so in closing, I, I thank you all. I believe that a well-resourced fire service contributes to council's initiative of, a, of a, uh, a prosperous economy, communities, the environment, uh, and, um, and I thank you all for, uh, for your, for your uh, past support, and I hope that you will uh, consider uh, making the amendment to the budget to uh, include this fall class. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Before you uh, step away, could you uh, entertain a question from Councillor Lovelace? Thank you, uh, and, and thank you for being here today. Uh, it has been a difficult year. Uh, I am interested in, in your comments with regards to the fall uh, hiring. Um, it is a concern that uh, you know we don't have uh, the firefighters established uh, and operating as expected in Middle Muscadabit. Obviously, for Upper Tantellon and Hammonds Plains, we kind of took a back seat um, to having 24/7 uh, service, uh, especially having experienced um, the largest wildfire and uh, largest evacuation of people. Um, it's, uh, it, it is time to look at that. So my question to you is, um, considering the difficulty with that process to recruit and train and hire and get people established, uh, it, it, is, it appears to be your opinion that um, the fall hiring is the best way to accelerate um, that training and establishment of those full-time staff. So with that in mind, are you, are you considering that 
um, having those staff, that staff recruitment process kind of continuous throughout the summer and into the fall is the best way to actually get those people into those roles or is there difficulty with the recruitment process? Not necessarily training, but actually getting people interested in serving uh, with Halifax Fire. Uh, through the chair, uh, Councillor, uh, thank you for your question. I don't believe that recruitment is a major challenge for our department. It seems a lot of people want to come and work at uh, Halifax Fire and want to be part of our fire service. Um, we, we train our own and um, I'll speak anecdotally, a member of my crew has uh, trained as a volunteer firefighter here in Halifax, uh, trained in the military, went to a paid career fire school, and then was hired as a career firefighter here and trained in our career recruit training program. Um, he said our career recruit training program was the best program of those four. Oh. So this through uh, dedication and hard work mm -hmm. of our training officers, uh, the, facility, the facilities that we have to train on mm. are uh, are under-resourced and, and they do need to be addressed and improved upon. Um, but uh, my my opinion on 10 Talon is yes, we we need to move up a hiring and, mm -hmm. and hire 20 in the fall. Uh, they would probably start the last week of August, first week of September, right. which would have them in the stations at around Christmas time. Yeah. And I believe that they should, they should go to Hammonds Plains or 10 Talon to start. Brilliant. And I look at other communities, um, I worked a shift in Sheet Harbor about a month and a half ago. Um, it was some freezing rain. I drove home on, on a Sunday morning uh, when there were no staff in the Muscadabit Harbor Station or in the Ches uh, Cook Station, and there was a head-on collision uh, right. down there. And you know that delays service response. You know when we look at you know fire spread and, and uh, mm -hmm. delayed uh, having staff in stations, um, you know, prevents and limits loss. Right. And so uh, I believe it's, it's in the interest of all of our communities to plan for years ahead, recognize the deficits we have now, and have a chart, uh, plan, a, plan a path to hire 20 spring and fall for at least the next several years while we catch up to our service delivery standard and, and start meeting those targets and address some of the, the other gaps that we have. Well said. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Brendan, just again, uh, Councillor Mancini, if you would. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Brendan, good to see you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to all your members uh, for their service to our municipality. It's muchly appreciated. I I'm going to ask you a question about mental health because I've been asked the chief the same question when he comes up. Can you give us, uh, from your perspective and the union's perspective, the state of the mental health support uh, for your, your uh, firefighters as it exists today? Uh, through the chair, uh, thank you for your question, Councillor. <coughs> Excuse me. We have um, a very competent and dedicated firefighter assistance program coordinator. Um, he helps a lot of people and prevents exasperation for many. Um, we have gaps in our resources that, um, that uh, leave some of our members in a state of crisis where we don't necessarily have access to or, or means to get them what they need. Um, we've had three member suicides in five years um, and, and numerous uh, uh, situations where members have been in crisis where they required support and, um, and have luckily uh, those, those situations have had better outcomes so far. Um, there are resources outside of standard resources that you can access through insurance providers and so on that we know anecdotally through um, uh, providers in other communities that, that these resources are showing to be effective. Uh, best treatment strategies for occupational stress injuries are still in development. And uh, so the charity Fight for Life was started by the family of one of our members who um, lost their battle with occupational stress. And uh, they have raised and distributed over $200,000. And I know they have sent a number of our members for resiliency training at a facility in British Columbia. Um, these members are now um, many, well, several of them are back in the workplace or have not left the workplace. Uh, fiscally, economically, it's it's been 
uh, an investment that's returned many times, not just in, in uh, the avoidance of the worst outcome, but giving people the tools to be able to come back and, uh, and work and manage uh, the stress that they experience through what we do. So we, uh, we do have uh, talented people doing good work, but we, we need more resources to help people that are at a certain stage in their, in their, in their injuries from occupational stress. Yeah, I thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Thank you very much, Brendan. Our next speaker this morning is uh, Mr. Patrick Sullivan, who is the president of the CEO of the Halifax Chamber of Commerce. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Your Worship. Uh, good morning, councillors uh, and uh, and staff, uh, and uh, good morning to the uh, the firefighters behind me. Um, I'm reminded, um, as I uh, as I listened to Brendan, um, my uh, uncle passed away uh, almost two years ago, a 27-year uh, uh, firefighter and uh, head of the union for uh, for two terms. So anyway, spent a lot of time with him, uh, and uh, anyway, heard a lot of great stories. Um, Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak this morning. Uh, I want to speak uh, specifically uh, about taxes, uh, and uh, as you would expect, I would, uh, and uh, tax increases particularly. Um, I uh, want to first uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about Halifax's growth. Uh, clearly, Halifax is growing. We are thrilled and excited at the Halifax Chamber of Commerce uh, with our over 1,900 members and over 90,000 employees. Uh, that are engaged with those uh, 1,900 members. Uh, how happy we are uh, to see the significant growth that is occurring in, uh, in Halifax right now. Uh, and I want, would like to just take a moment to commend the municipality uh, for participating in the Housing Accelerator Fund. Uh, and uh, we're excited about that program and are anxious to see that that come to fruition uh, over the next little while. Uh, I want to clearly state um, that we acknowledge that it is a difficult time for municipalities, uh, and that is municipalities across the country. Um, the fiscal framework uh, that has been developed in Canada over uh, generations um, doesn't seem to be working uh, quite as well uh, as it has in the past. Um, and we have clearly asked the province uh, for a new fiscal framework that recognizes the if you will, advance spending that cities are required to do um, to accommodate the growth. Um, if we, I, I know we all know uh, that the province of Nova Scotia has benefited from increased population. Um, that increased population, um, we seek to remind them frequently, uh, is 75% uh, settling in Halifax. So people are coming to Halifax. Halifax is growing. Um, and the province has benefited with over a billion dollars in additional revenue, unbudgeted additional revenue, um, for the last couple of years. Uh, and the city has not nearly seen uh, that, income, uh, that income or revenue increase. So we recognize the difficulty uh, that, uh, that is in place. Having said that, uh, cost pressures are mounting for businesses as well. Businesses, unfortunately, need that break. Many of them have not yet recovered from COVID. Uh, we are seeing a recent repayment of the, uh, of the CBA loan uh, that has impacted businesses. We're seeing closures. We expect to see more closures in the coming months, uh, weeks and months. Um, we have had successive uh, increases um, in Halifax, perhaps understandably, um, given, again, that uh, poor fiscal framework that I, uh, that I mentioned. Um, but, you know, if I look to 2022, the average residential property tax bill increased $94 to $2,144, while the average commercial property tax bill increased $1,889 to $45,000. At a 5% margin for a $40 meal, that's nearly 1,000 more meals that need to be prepared and sold by, an, uh, by a restaurant. Uh, so. The latest data from our uh, Halifax Chamber of Commerce business conditions report showed that nearly 70% of the Halifax businesses ranked cost-related obstacles as their biggest challenge in the next three months. So this is a real problem. We've tried to provide a rather simple, uh, simple suggestions uh, in our recommendations this year rather than the 20 or 30 that we used to provide. Uh, one, we acknowledge the taxes need to go up. 
we would ask that they go up the amount of inflation or roughly 4.1%. This will help with affordability issues uh, and aid our members. Um, we would like to see, uh, and we were specific in the document that we sent to all of you, so I'm not really replicating or repeating that document, uh, not repeating that document. Uh, so, you know, I would encourage you to take a look at that pre-budget submission. We do come up with some suggestions. Some of them are quite out of character for us, like actually increasing debt. Uh, but we do think that uh, at a time when the city is growing as a precursor to the expected revenue that you'll get when, um, when those houses are built and when people start to pay taxes, uh, we'd like to, uh, like to have you take on a little more debt. So I guess I'm going to stop at this point. You done? I think we, I think we somehow lost a minute. If you had another 30 oh, seconds or so, I'd let you continue. Okay, perfect. So just to reference the document again, uh, what we suggested is that you spend from reserves on a few specific projects. Um, we've uh, recommended uh, that you, um, what else? Oh, that you uh, are cautious with the Housing Accelerator Fund. Uh, the Housing Accelerator Fund um, is going to get some money, but you're recommending the hiring of 33 new staff. Um, and those staff are effectively on, um, are, would be on permanent. Uh, we recommend that you try to hire those staff on a uh, contractual basis um, in, in the interim in case that revenue uh, drops off in the two to three years that the Housing Accelerator Fund uh, will take. So a couple of specifics there. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a question for me of clarification, sure. um, Patrick. So in this budget, Jerry, correct me if I'm wrong, we're, we're increasing debt per household to 1800 um, Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. So <laughs> we're still well below any other order of government in terms of obvious debt, but we recognize not wanting to put a debt load on future generations, but I, I agree with that. Do you think we should go beyond the 1800 or is there a specific number that the Chamber has done? Yeah, I don't think there's a specific number, but okay. I think what we would say is that the current debt uh, for the municipality is around three or four percent, and you're allowed to have debt of up to 15 percent. Um, so I think there is a place and a time when Halifax is growing so rapidly and infrastructure is needed, and I'm kind of pointing back here uh, at the fire department, when infrastructure is needed, uh, that you may need to pay for that infrastructure in advance with debt and then pay that debt down over time. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any questions of clarification. I would just want to um, thank you for your comment, and I, you've been consistent in your advocacy of this new fiscal framework that we're, we've talked about. As council would know, I stepped away a little bit early on Wednesday from budget to go to a chamber uh, economic session where they had the Premier, Sean Fraser, and a bunch of other folks. And um, the first question I was asked was um, very much in, along those lines, which I thought was a great way to start our discussion about the fiscal framework and the, 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 the load that's on municipalities uh, in terms of us being the generators of growth in this country. So thank you, Mr. Sullivan, very much. Great, thank you very much. Those are the two names on the list. Is there anybody else who wishes to uh, speak to budget today? Is there anybody else that wishes to speak to the budget today? If there's nobody else looking to speak to budget today, then we will move ahead. And uh, we're pleased to have with us uh, our officials from the Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency. Chief and uh, whoever else you need, welcome back to Council. It's always great to see you. I will hand the floor over to uh, Chief Stubbe. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of Council Ken Steubing, the Executive Director and Fire Chief for Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency. My pronouns are he and him, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present HRFE's business plan and budget for 2024. I would also like to introduce some of our team here today, Deputy Chiefs Roy Hollett, Dave Meldrum, Peter Andrews, and Corey Beals. 
To my left, I have our policy and business initiatives coordinator, Jennifer Mark, and I'm sure you'll recognize our newly minted manager of administrative services back there, Lori McKinnon, and we also have our financial business partner here uh, if we have any financial questions. Isaac. Chief, just one sec, could we get this new person, this Lori McKinnon person, just to stand up for a sec? I haven't seen her in uniform before today, so Lori. <laughs> Sorry, Chief. <laughs> oh, just a second now. We have a number of questions of clarification for Lori McKinnon. That, no, we don't. No, we don't. Chief, go ahead. I won't come out of your side. I would like to acknowledge Captain and President Brendan uh, Mahar for being here today and thank not only him and his executive team, but also members of our team who are plugged in virtually to help answer any questions you might have here today. I would like to acknowledge uh, also Mr. Mayor and some of our councillors who are probably in their last round of budget deliberations and certainly with the rest of council included in our comments and gratitude for your support. Certainly over the last six and a half years I've been here as mentioned by Brendan. Uh, I know your job is not easy. So thank you for your support and your service to HRM. And I would like to acknowledge that 2023 was an unprecedented year for our team. I continue to be honored to work alongside almost 1,150 dedicated career and volunteer firefighters and our support team committed to protecting our communities and the public. They continue to be there when needed 24 seven work in difficult, arduous, and dangerous conditions at a moment's notice. As a quick reminder, you also have in your package a quick fact sheet in case you would like to reference it. Our annual report will be posted online in about two weeks. And for those joining us electronically, there's also an illustration of our emergency response time targets so you can help understand what we're talking about as we go through those KPIs. Although this slide says successes, I would not uh, talk about the first topic without reflection on the difficulty for the communities that we're talking about. Uh, the Tintalan wildfire certainly was a challenge for many people in our community with devastating loss. On Sunday, May 28th, at approximately 4.30, HRFE responded to an out of control illegal burn that quickly developed into a multi-agency response. HRFE was initially the incident commander for this event and implemented a wide scale evacuation with the assistance of RCMP and other agencies. After the first 16 hours on scene, HRFE transferred command to DNRR and worked closely with them in a unified command model for the remainder of the incident that spanned several weeks. Upon arrival, HRFE crews were met with a rapidly moving wind-driven wildfire with multiple structures on fire that required a mass evacuation. HRFE not only initiated door-to-door -door evacuations and command of the firefighting activities, but also provided logistics support for all personnel on scene, facilitated regular site media updates, assisted with the post-fire wildfire investigation, and then conducted investigations on all destroyed buildings and assessments on all damaged or undamaged buildings in the, in the evacuation zone remedied unsafe conditions to expedite the safe return of residents. When it was over, more than 16,000 residents had been evacuated, 151 homes destroyed, 200 structures damaged, and amazingly, not one significant injury for a resident or a, or a firefighter. While still engaged in the Upper Tentalan Wildfire on June 1st, HRFE was requested by DNRR through the provincial EMO director to have Task Force 5 set up a base camp to house up to three international wildland firefighters in the community of Shelburne, which ended up being the largest wildfire in Nova Scotia history. 
Despite a significant commitment to the Upperton Talon wildfire at the time, Task Force deployed along with Task Force 2 from Toronto to set up a base camp. This was the first time in Canadian history that I'm aware of that two task force teams were simultaneously deployed. Fortunately, significant rain helped the crews get a handle on Shelburne, the Shelburne wildfire and the Tintalan wildfire shortly after that. Then on July 22nd, Nova Scotia experienced more than 250 millimeters of rain in 24 hours, causing flash floods, the evacuation of numerous residents, and a local state of emergency. Again, HRFE was out front during this entire event, mitigating dangers, rescuing residents, and fulfilling its mission to save lives, property, and the environment. HRFE also responded when requested with three boats and crews to provide a mutual aid response to Hans County for six days to assist with the search of missing persons. We also successfully launched FireSmart as part of our WUI strategy prior to the wildfire. We had identified that as a risk and ended up becoming the first fire department in Eastern Canada to implement FireSmart and uh, we are expanding that program this year. Last year, HRFE started to roll out our self-contained breathing apparatus project. I'm not gonna talk about this a lot here, uh, but I'll share on it a little bit later on the project for the next year. Our fire inspection program continued to expand. This is the use of operational firefighters to assist our fire prevention staff. Phase two was successfully launched. The components of phase two included updating our training adding additional building types to the buildings inspected, improving our scheduling for inspections for client uh, convenience, and adding eight more stations to assist with that work. Our medical first responder program has continued to demonstrate benefits with our partnership with EHS to align our emergency medical response. We have significant efforts that will be underway this year and that partnership has yielded hundreds of thousands of dollars in capital investments for defibrillators and medical equipment and consumables. Our Eastern Shore Lifestyle style, uh, Life Center uh, that is located in Sheet Harbor. The tender was awarded in November of 2023, and now HRFE is eagerly involved in the planning for what will become a community hub for the region with libraries, parks, and recs. Uh, this work is being led by the PFA team and engaging uh, with the Eastern Shore Lifestyle Center Society. This is a multi-level government funded project and will certainly make a difference in the community. Station 38, Middle Muscadabit, as you heard, we have our recruits onboarded. They started on Monday, and our goal is to have those recruits ready to staff that station as soon as that station is ready to be able to take them. We are also putting additional measures in to support the volunteers until such time as the firefighters can be deployed out of that station. Firefighter paging system upgrade. Significant work done, uh, a lot of this was behind the scenes. HRFE led an upgrade to paging sites in HRM, which will improve the reliability of the paging systems used to alert firefighters and fire stations of emergencies in their community. After more than 20 years of service, the system has been hardened with highly reliable fiber connections and emergency backup power supplies. Diversity and inclusion. HRFE continued our ongoing efforts to deepen relationships with equity seeking communities and the community at large to help us attract and retain a diverse workforce. We continued our efforts to support an equitable workplace and culture of inclusivity and provided educational programs for all members on racism, bias, and microaggression. Over 200 outreach engagement sessions were, over 250 outreach engagement sessions were attended by our members. Firefighter training. In addition to ongoing training for skills and knowledge improvements for our existing firefighter, our 
Training Academy continues to onboard new firefighters, as you heard. Last year, we onboarded 44 firefighters uh, in the career sector and 73 firefighters in the volunteer sector. With both of those sectors increasing representation from all employment equity groups identified in HRM policy. Slide four, as you can see on this table, the numbers of failed inspections has dropped for the first time in five years. This is a promising trend as there are fewer follow-up inspections required to ensure they have become in compliance and it allows us to divert inspections to uninspected buildings. Conversely, the complete, completed cases number has increased to 950, which is an increase of 11%. That is all good news. Unfortunately, our completed cases remains at 26%. That is largely because of the increase in building stock that we are now required to inspect and, uh, and the increase uh, of buildings identified in our better data collection systems. So certainly we will continue to track that legislated requirement. In 2023, HRFE responded to 16,684 incidents, which is an increase of 11% over last year. Last year, I had told you that we had a 30% increase in our call volume. That was partly to do with the decrease in call volume during COVID, largely in the medical area. However, if you compare that to 2019 data, Prior to COVID, our response call volume has gone up 28%. So let's just talk a little bit about our performance metrics here. As you can see, uh, we have our performance indicators for emergency response time targets. They're there in our business plan. I'm not gonna go over them in great details. I will highlight a couple points for you. Uh, as you can see, we have different color arrows. A reminder to council that yellow arrows, whether they be up or down, are not statistically significant. Although, obviously, I'd rather an up arrow than a down arrow that's yellow. Uh, so you can see we have a statistically significant improvement in our urban medical calls of 4.7%. Moving on to the next indicators, again, all statistically not significant, although there are some bigger numbers there right, with 8.7 and 7.2%. The reason they're not statistically significant, and I'm not a statistician, is based on the number of calls that obviously we're calculating, and it is a mathematical calculation. Uh, moving on to the next slide. We have lovingly referred to this as our blue dot, red dot diagram to help you understand where our call distribution is coming in the urban footprint. Uh, so our blue dots represent calls where we achieved the effective firefighting force. And you can see that most of that call distribution is in and around the Halifax and Dartmouth areas. And as I've shared with you in the past, we continue to struggle in the Bedford, Sackville, Eastern Passage and Spryfield area. And that footprint continues to expand. Uh, you know, Hammonds Plains uh, is another good example in Fall River. You can see for the first time that we have included in this diagram the planned developments. These are approved plans by council and planning and development, and they are now on our radar, and we are doing the analysis to understand the impact on our response times, and I'll cover that a little bit later. So moving on to our red dot uh, diagram. This is the bad news. These are all the calls that we did not achieve an EFF and should have. These were houses on fire, where we could not assemble an effective firefighting force in the time required by council or uh, outlined by council and certainly an industry best practice. And as you can see, we're now starting to get red dots in the Dartmouth and Halifax area. So moving on to the next colored dots, these are the calls that we responded to that did not require an EFF meaning a, a crew got there, typically the first in crew, and remedied the situation and told the rest of the crews, I don't need you. They might needed a second crew, but they did not need an EFF. But 
conceivably, these all came in as active fires and could have needed an EFF. And when we move on to the next slide, you can see if you add all those dots together, those are all the fires, not including medicals, not including rescues, not including car accidents that we responded to in one year in the urban footprint. And that performance has dropped by 3.2%, although not statistically significant. And this is our diagram that we've used in, uh, in the past, and I'm quite proud of this diagram. It really helps me personally understand how red our red dots are, how far we are from getting a red dot to turn to a blue dot. And for the first time in my discussion with you, we have slipped. So uh, you can see that typically our 90th percentile, our nine out of 10 responses are around four or eight firefighters. And then getting those other six firefighters there to the scene is getting harder and harder and harder. Which really means our incident commanders are now trying to figure out, do I save the house beside the house on fire or do I try to effect a rescue? And what happens if we have a May Day situation? Do they have enough resources to effectively fight that fire? So let's talk about our planned activities uh, for the year. As you can see, we said we are focusing on growth, but it also includes risk. This year, HRFE will work closely with our partners in planning and development, IT, and public works to assess growth nodes across HRM in relation to population density, emergency response needs, capacity, and community risk. We will also onboard new staff with specific skills to do this work, because I'm a firefighter, not an urban planner. Operational uh, implementation of station number 38. As identified, we are looking to turn that station into a 24 7 365 composite station model to support the volunteer sector. Uh, HRFE will also move forward with phase two of our wildland urban interface strategy. This work will include assessing community risk related to wildfires, increasing our fire smart assessors to assess critical infrastructure, homes and businesses. HRFE will purchase new, four new wildfire br brush trucks, new uh, equipment specifically for wildfire fighting, including mobile Fire uh, mobile suppression unit, which will be the first in Atlantic Canada, and wildland fire sprinkler trailers. We will be training our firefighters in skills and our officers in strategies and tactics to deal with these incidents. HRFE will also partner, which I'm very excited about, HRFE will also partner with DNRR on a fuel reduction strategy and pilot new early detection technology with artificial intelligence to give early activation and get our crews out to the scene upwards of hours before normally reported. This allows us to be able to fight the fire while it's small and probably uh, stop it from spreading. Uh, that work is going to be a first for Canada and a first on the Atlantic seaboard of North America. Uh, we will continue to partner with the Halifax Port Authority on a risk reduction strategy. Deputy Chief, current, uh, Deputy Chief Hollett is currently seconded to the port to help them develop a risk reduction strategy, particularly focused on fire inspections and emergency response to port assets, including uh, ships. We will continue to move forward with our partnership to align our medical services in phase two of our medical response strategy with EHS and our continued efforts to improve our HUSAR program. This is an ongoing initiative. Over the next year, we will continue to develop our heavy urban search and rescue or task force five capability in preparation for local and interprovincial emergencies. This will include purchasing additional trailers for deployment, a boat, drones, medical equipment, training, additional canines, and growing the team through recruitment and training to national and international standards. The federal program uh, continues to build towards a national accreditation process that we need to be part of, the concept of operations document, and the development of standards. A reminder to Council, this is a cost shared program with 75% of the funds coming from the feds. 
I've already touched on uh, the new personnel in Tintallon. If the budget is approved council uh, by council, HRFE is anticipating the conversion of a station in the Tintallon area, either 50 or 65, depending on the data that we uh, uncover. Uh, which is converting it from a daytime staffing model to a 24-7 staffing model with career and volunteer firefighters. And we've connected with the stakeholders uh, on that, which would be namely our career and volunteer firefighters. We will also be reviewing our traffic calming administrative order in HRM. This is a joint effort between Public Works and Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency, where we, where we will work together to undertake a review of the traffic calming administrative order to assess its impact on emergency response times. We will also work with IT to support the roster program, which is an IT project aimed at being able to help us quickly establish the staffing roster for our daily shifts. Um, we will also be implementing the next work on our self-contained breathing apparatus. So these are the air bottles we carry on our back and probably the most important piece of per personal protective equipment we wear and they are timing out this year the bottles. So uh, in 2024 logistics will catal catalog or sorry catalog the new inventory and conduct pre-inspections of all of that equipment. They will do bench testing on it, record mandatory training for all of our personnel and roll out the equipment, ensure it is ready to go and take back the old equipment. The cost of this program is $8.7 million over two years and it will be done by the end of this year. HRFE will also develop uh, a consolidated safety program to ensure compliance with all legislation and improve the health and safety of our members. This will include a review and update of all of our policies and procedures and any other safety information and make it available to our members in a common digital storage location. TMR radio placement, we've talked about this in the past, the, this project includes a replacement of 90 vehicle mounted and 610 handheld portable radios for the fire service. Equipment will be upgraded where necessary to meet requirements for ruggedness and the operation in high heat firefighting and dangerous to life conditions. The new radio system will be fully encrypted adding to the security and confidentiality for our clients. HRFE has joined the seated radio program through the province of Nova Scotia, which will relieve pressure on HRM's capital budget to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars and create an opportunity for a broader communication strategy and interoperability with other agencies and security through encrypted radio traffic. Our medical program, over the next year, HRFE will implement a medical quality assurance and audit program. This will include a medical documentation of all medical responses by HRFE. The initiative will focus on quality and risk management for medical services, align with accreditation requirements, and achieve full compliance with EH's MFR program and allow us to move forward on our partnership. This will also include the rollout of new defibrillators. Working closely with EHS has resulted in being uh, able to get brand new defibrillators from the province, which has saved us hundreds of thousands of dollars in our capital budget. By Q1 of this year, 75 defibrillators will be introduced to frontline operations with the remaining devices implemented later in the year. These new AEDs or defibrillators will provide uh, compatibility with provincial EMS systems to facilitate expedited patient care transfer and support the data tracking and reporting in compliance with patient care documentation and quality assurance standards. This initiative is saving us about $250,000 out of our capital budget and about $30,000 annually for consumables. Diversity inclusion. HRV will continue to create and deliver a building a better fire service education modules as we move forward. Further effort will be made in review and revision of our policies with a DNI lens to ensure inclusive language and promote equity, fairness, and respect. Workplace culture will refine a new five year work plan spanning from 2526 to 2930, which will build on the previous DNI initiatives we've done. 
HRFE has a healthy pool of recruitment candidates for our career sector ready to de be deployed. The volunteer program has had signif significant success increasing our volunteer ranks over the last three years. In 2021, we had 478 volunteer firefighters. In 2024, we now have 547 volunteer firefighters, which is an increase of about 14% of a, above and beyond the 33 members who transition to the career ranks. HRFE will continue to build on the success of the past through community outreach, marketing and engagement, focusing on the communities most in need. Plans for this year will focus on volunteer leadership, developing new and existing members and utilizing feedback from the volunteer engagement survey to identify opportunities for improvement and better address volunteer needs moving forward. HRFE will also continue our work towards fire service professional certification, which is an industry best practice. And over the next year, we will be working on our standards of a cover for our accreditation, which is still on track for a site visit in 18 months. I reported on station alerting last year. Unfortunately, that project has not yet moved forward, but we are expecting it to do that this year. The result of this project will probably yield, based on our calculations, about 30 seconds on emergency response times. So when we're talking, you know, five minute drive times, that's a significant contribution to improving that. So moving on to slide 13, um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide because there's another slide coming up, but uh, just to touch on a couple of the changes to our FTEs. Uh, emergency management was, as you know, moved over to community safety. As a result of that, three positions were moved over. The emergency management coordinator and assistant chief, uh, Erica Fleck, along with two assistant coordinators. The one assistant coordinator was actually a term position and the term position had just ended at that transfer. So I think you noticed that uh, Bill Moore had identified there was no funding for that position and that's the reason why the term had ended. Uh, we also will cover the 15 firefighters on the next slide. When uh, corporately we implemented new enterprise uh, personnel tracking systems, during a deep dive with HR, F, uh, with HR, we found a district chief in our wage model that was identified as a position number, but there was no funding. So that position has been removed from our wage model, uh, but there was no money associated with it. In our emergency service achievement program, which is a good news story not many people know about, is a program that we run that is fully funded by the feds uh, and it is aimed at helping uh, disadvantaged youth find uh, employment. So we leverage our brand and our connection in the community to help these folks uh, develop some hard skills and soft skills to help them uh, end up with uh, permanent employment, employment. So these positions were remo removed from the wage model, but they're funded by the federal government. So that's why they were removed. We don't plan on dropping that program. And uh, service enhancements, uh, the biggest one I'll talk about here is obviously the 15 firefighters that uh, you've already had some conversation around uh, the table about. And our anticipation is if the budget is approved, we will move forward to add 15 more firefighters to our complement and convert this one of the stations in the Tin Talon area from a daytime staffing model to a 24 hour staffing model. Thank you for your time, Mr. Mayor. I think that's a record for me, and uh, I will take any questions you have. Thank you very much. Uh, you can have another 30 seconds if you, if you want it, Chief. Thank you. Well, just stay where you are. We'll begin uh, with uh, Councillor Lovelace, who maybe could put the motion on the floor and take away the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency proposed 2024-25 budget and business plan as set out and discussed in the accompanying plan and supporting presentation attached to the staff report dated March 1st, 2024 into the draft 2024-25 operating budget. Second. Second by Councillor Mancini, Councillor Lum. Thank you, uh, Councillor Mancini. So, 
Wow, um, great presentation. Um, my goodness, when I look back at my first budget um, as part of this council to today, what an incredible advancement of work and uh, just, just you know, new fire stations coming on board, um, new uh, professionalization from an operational perspective, efficiencies. I heard you say savings a few times, my ears perked up. This is great because we're increasing productivity, we're increasing efficiencies, and we're making the fire service as responsive as possible. So good work, Chief, I appreciate that. We've been through a lot, uh, it's been a tough year, and um, certainly the launch of the FireSmart program prior to the wildfire um, has really been accelerated over this past year. There's so much interest from across the entire region. People are excited to, to learn more about FireSmart, take, you know, be accountable. And, uh, and take action in their own communities, in, uh, on their own property. Um, certainly the, the work that, um, that we're seeing uh, and, and the changes on people's property is a benefit. That means that fire service won't need to be called, right? Um, but that being said, I'm really happy to hear that we're going to um, look at the administrative order with traffic calming. Uh, as you know, we had a fire uh, house loss uh, yesterday morning uh, on Bond Street. Um, lots of traffic calming uh, with potential delays for uh, fire service, but also no access to water easily, right? It was up and over the traffic calming to get to the fire hydrants because there's no dry hydrants. So first question, where are we at with installation of more dry fire hydrants? I know that's been a, uh, an ongoing concern over the last um, uh, number of years, but it accelerated because of the wildfire. Um, you mentioned um, the DUI um, or the diversity inclusion, um, uh, you know, training that, that uh, folks are, are taking, obviously anti-black racism and so on and so forth. So I, I, my question is around what about the trauma-informed training? Um, how, how, is, how are we advancing uh, with that work? And I'd like to know from a, um, uh, from a service perspective with the Housing Accelerator Fund, obviously we've got some concerns uh, in the community with regards to current standards and meeting those standards. What happens when we have 40 story buildings? Um, we know that there are uh, other fire services, I think from Toronto that are coming in to assist Halifax Regional Fire in doing training for um, large structures, uh, but just wondering where are we at with accessing the tools and the equipment and ensuring that our folks uh, have the training that they need. I'm also curious as to uh, how we could speed up uh, the training, and as you heard uh, from uh, Brendan, um, who spoke earlier, how could we ensure that we do get that fall training session in place? Uh, to be clear, Tantallon is about eight kilometers from Upper Tantallon, which is where Station 65 is. Um, and further than that is Station 50. So what we're actually talking about is the Upper Tantallon and Hammonds Plains area, but specifically Pockwalk Road and Upper Hammonds Plains. Um, more than 2,000 units are going in there right now, uh, very large multi-unit buildings. Um, so I'd like to know how we can actually speed up um, access to trained cadets, get them graduated sooner. I don't think February 2025 is gonna do the trick, considering we're still in an extreme wildfire situation in Upper Ten Talon and Hammonds Plains. Those are my questions for now. I've got a lot more. Great to hear about Deputy, Deputy Chief Hollett's work with the Port of Halifax. Certainly lots of um, activity happening there, lots of growth. Uh, but overall, I just wanna say thank you and good work. Bravo Zulu, good job. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, through the mayor to you, Councillor. Thank you for your question. So in the capital budget in uh, item, is this the right one, Laurie? Correct. In, uh, can, <laughs> it's small printing even with my cheaters on. CE190001 is the capital budget for the dry hydrant program. You will see we've expanded the amount of money that we're seeking to be able to build more dry hydrants. It also includes a position to manage that work instead of managing it off the side of your desk. So there are basically, outside the hydranted areas, there are two solutions for water supply. One is dry hydrants, 
which are complicated and require access to a body of water. Right. The truck needs to be able to get close to it. Yep. There's all kinds of environmental approvals you need to get. Uh, and then you need to maintain them, make sure that the strainers don't get clogged up uh, and we go out and check them. So right. every single year we check the, those dry hydrants and add more dry hydrants to our inventory. And based on the amount of money we have, we try to prioritize them. Although if the building, if, if the development is already done, getting access to that water becomes a challenge. So right. the goal that we have in the one, uh, project that we have for this year is to fix the problem moving forward in developments that haven't happened okay. and to have more money to go out and fix the problem in the communities that already are developed. So <clears throat> the way we might be able to do that where we can't, or the way we can deal with that in places we can't get access to water is with cisterns. So they are much easier to put in, they are much quicker to put in, but they cost a lot more money. So our goal by adding this additional budget is to speed up the amount of access to water we can do okay. by pivoting to more cisterns and just get them put in the ground quickly. Okay. And then wherever we can put dry hydrants in, put them in, and more importantly, with future developments, develop the community with water supply. And the capital budget includes the administrative costs for that yes. position. Okay, perfect. So it's operationalized already. Thank you. So I will ask uh, Deputy Chief uh, Dave Meldrum to come up and talk about our trauma-informed training question that you have. Um, uh, as far as the training for high rises that you were talking about, Thank you. as part of our accreditation process and somewhere uh, on the last slide, I think it is on program enhancements, you can talk, you can see we talk specifically about water rescue and swift water rescue. Yes. As part of our accreditation, we are required to assess every program we provide. Uh -huh. So we have already started that work and uh, you can see the water rescue strategy has identified gaps between what council says we have to do and what we have the tools and training yes. to actually do. Okay. As a result of that, we are improving all the services that we have if we find gaps to hit the accreditation standard, which is partly why we did that high rise training. Did you want to add to that? Accreditation. Yes. Um, no, no Good. Direct you. Did, did I answer your question oh, you on did. training? Yes, oh, yeah, so linking that to the accreditation oh, program is, is very helpful, thank you. So Deputy Chief Meldrum will talk about your trauma-informed training. Sure thing. Good morning, my name is Dave Meldrum. I'm a Deputy Chief with Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency. Through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, the committee. Thank you, Councillor, for the question. This is on our minds, trauma-informed training. So we've spent a lot of time and energy because now inclusion and respect are not a project or a program. It's it's what we do, right. it's we fight fires, we respond to medical emergencies, we do other things and we do respect. Um, this year we are looking through a lot, we've met with a lot of partners, we've met with Fight for Life, we've met with Tema Foundation, BOS, PSP Net, uh, there are others, who am I forgetting, Wounded Warriors, Landing Strong, and we're thinking about strategies now, not only to teach how to respect and communicate with each other, which includes a portfolio of reduction of bullying within our own service, mm -hmm. and how do we treat our clients and customers. So Tema has worked with us on recruit training in the prior course, and we're, we're developing more information about how we can do trauma-informed work in the future. Excellent, thank you. Something else, Chief? Just you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, to answer your last question, uh, the cost for speeding up the training as you identified for the Tintalan area. Really the implications for that would be additional funding to move the recruit class from February to uh, August. Uh, some small money required for whatever we need to do to, to the station and expediting that work. Um, and I would also say we need to know sooner rather than later because we need to let the recruits know four months before the start of their uh, hiring that they need to come in and get set up in the system and, 
go through all the assessments we need to be able to onboard them. So currently we're not planning for August. We could do that. You heard we have a gap in our mm -hmm. training schedule because we have not been notified of retirements. We, we are carrying people who are kind of in that age where they could kind of pull the chute, uh, which is what uh, the president just shared with you. But at this point, uh, we do have a gap in our training schedule to be able to accommodate that, but would require funding. Thank you, I will place that motion later. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your leniency. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chief Meldrum, for identifying yourself. I don't think that there is a deputy fire chief in the country that became as familiar to its uh, <laughs> residents as you last year. Thank you for the work that you and everybody else uh, did, so thank you. Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's a good place to start the work of last year. I mean, 2023, Chief, was uh, uh, unique and unheard of and historic in many ways. And, you know, uh, after the fires, uh, you know, there's been criticism and discussion in communities and Councillor Mason and I were just chatting thinking, oh my goodness, I mean, look what happened. It was the perfect storm, the fire, uh, the wildfires, Wagwaltic at the same time. And, uh, and then we had the rains and the floods and the list goes on and on. And I mean, it's remarkable, not one life lost, uh, you know, could you have more resources? Could you have more equipment? Could we have more better exits out of communities? Yes, 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 but unbelievable. So to the men and women that serve uh, in the leadership, fantastic work, Chief. Uh, I think we're all very proud of uh, our fire service. So, so thank you for that. Uh, lots of questions, and I, and I, I asked a question to uh, the union president, Brendan Meyer, when he, when he uh, spoke, and uh, I'm going to ask you a similar question. I know uh, Deputy Chief Meldrum just alluded to the trauma-informed training, but the, the, here, uh, a year ago, uh, you, uh, you were here presenting last year's budget, and I asked you a similar question about do you have the back of your firefighters, and you explained the work that was be, being done to support your firefighters. So my question is, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. Since a year ago, what's new uh, in the fire service that's supporting um, the help that our, uh, the mental help uh, that our firefighters uh, are, are required? Thank you, through the mayor to you, Councillor, thank you for the question. I'll ask Deputy Chief Meldrum again to come back up, who leads our wellness program. And while he's walking to the mic, I'll say certainly you can't do enough work in this area. I'll just right. kind of start with that preface. Um, but we do, as he identified, have a competent manager who manages the program. And there are only a handful of fire services across the country who have any resources uh, on staff to do this work, and we're one of them. I would say we do not have the best practice across the country as far as our resources, um, but we have something. And uh, it is going to be uh, a growing issue across the country as mental health has been identified as a risk and a presumptive uh, a presumptive support, so i.e. if you are suffering from mental health, if you are in emergency services, you know, we're talking fire in this case, it is presumed that that is as a result of your occupation because right. they know we're at higher risk. And the same type of pre presumptive legislation exists for cancer and for cardiac and stroke emergencies, but they are, you know, a little bit easier to get people in for timely treatment as opposed to mental health. So some of our challenges are the healthcare sector itself. And I think we also need to realize that some of these incidents can't be pigeonholed as cardiac or cancer or mental health. Sometimes somebody gets a diagnosis of stage four cancer at 35 years old as a result of being a firefighter. Right and now you have a mental health problem, right? right? So uh, I will pass the talking stick over to my colleague. Thank you, Chief. There we are. Thank you, Chief. Uh, again, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to the committee and the councillor, thanks for the question. So, councillor, there is a broad uh, constellation of supports, both proactive and reactive for first responders, including our firefighters, uh, before they encounter occupational stress injury and when they encounter occupational stress injury. And let's, let's be clear, it's an imperfect network. 
and there are gaps within the network. But the network exists and we're proud of, of the supports that we deliver to our firefighters. We have a manager, an assistant chief, and a dedicated full-time firefighter and family assistance program coordinator who is a certified professional in the field who works in our business unit with no other calling but to support our firefighters. We continue to provide 24 seven 365 peer support. So any firefighter or any other member of our business unit can call and talk to a colleague right away and get a fast referral to immediate support. Sometimes it's therapy, sometimes it's access to other resources. Thanks to the funding of regional council, we have funding available to provide short term therapeutic and other supportive services to our firefighters and other members in their time of need. It's very important to get those folks stabilized, to get them to a position where they're able to understand the challenges that they face and the opportunities that exist in front of them for long-term uh, corrective um, approaches. We do resilience training because we want to prevent operational stress injury more than we want to react to it. We've done uh, certain face-to-face -face programs in the past. In this last year, we rolled out a voluntary online offering from BOS. We're working hard to bring back our face-to-face -face and in-person resiliency training. The requirements of the provider for licensing would, would create a very difficult condition for us now in terms of hours of duration of that learning and we'd have to bring firefighters in away from their frontline duties for prolonged periods. That's problematic so we're talking about that because right. we know how important that that is. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that our folks all have immediate real-time SISM debriefing services right away. They see some terrible things. They're exposed to terrible traumas. Any time of any day, anywhere in the year, they or their incident commanders can call and a SISM team will, will be there and start the de defusing process immediately. Again, they can call a peer referral agent and be referred to support immediately, funded by regional council. And our, the firefighters union and on our volunteer sides, both have longer term programs that provide offerings uh, for those members for treatment and recovery. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chief. I'll come back, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and um, a big thank you to everybody in your department for all the incredible work that's been done. Um, Deputy Chief Meldrum, I also just want to say thank you to you being the face and the voice, um, you know, the public facing voice during so much of the wildfires in Tantalan, and uh, I just think you did a commendable job with that in a very difficult circumstance. So. Communication is very important, and um, I just think that's worthy of noting. Um, okay, so uh, this is great. I'm really happy to see the increase in firefighters that have come on board in the last number of years, really, you know, kind of getting firefighters in the communities where we need them, and I think that's excellent work, and um, look forward to seeing the Muscadabit uh, station up and running. I think that that's critically important, and um, really fits with the wildlife urban interface strategy that we're working on. Um, I was just looking for some more information on that strategy, where I might find it. I, there's not a lot mentioned in the report about it, but I think it's, um, like you said, if it, this is a kind of a first, uh, it's something that we should really be talking about because it's a massive concern um, in those areas uh, like District 11 where I have uh, the Prospect Road or the Sambro Loop, um, you know, of great concern about how we're going to manage that. So more information on that would be really be wonderful. Um, I have a question um, specific to the um, emergency calls responded to. When I look at the chart here, I see that the highest number of calls is for medical assistance. Um, that, you know, when I look back at 2020, um, you know, there was a, a thousand, um, and now we're up close to 5,000. And uh, I know that that is an important part of the work that you do, and a meaningful part of the work for our firefighters and our volunteer firefighters, being able to be there to assist the community. But I gotta ask, what is driving that? And uh, we know at the provincial level that um, the emergency health services are, it seems to be um, failing. Like we hear stories almost every week of people waiting for emergency services 
uh, ambulances, particularly ambulances and first responders from the pr uh, provincial health system um, that aren't kind of meeting the performance targets. And I'm wondering how much of that is being filled in by our fire service and is there a costing to that? And what is that relationship with the province in, in, in terms of recognizing the role that the municipality is playing in providing that critical emergency medical response? Um, you know, I, I look at structure fires at, uh, you know, in this chart here, other, we have like 771 other fires. Um, compared to 4,800 emergency uh, medical assistance calls. And is that impacting our response to fire calls? So when we, you know, we, we're looking at the traffic uh, calming for one thing, we're looking at, you know, kind of the number of uh, full-time and career firefighters in our stations and making sure that we're, you know, staffed up but when I look at, you know, are, are, are people who should be responding to fires being diverted to um, other calls? And, you know, again, if you can just talk to, like, why we've seen such a massive increase from 2020 to even from 2019, pre-pandemic, we are below 3,000 to almost 5,000. Thank you. Thank you for your question through the mayor to you, Councillor. Uh, I will ask Deputy Chief Hollett to come up and um, give you a brief overview of our WUI strategy. <clears throat> Particularly the reason you haven't seen more detail on that is it's caught up in our strategic plan that uh, I didn't put in as a deliverable this year because I was tired of reporting on it, quite frankly. But uh, that is expected to get across the line right shortly and you will see some details on the strategic plan. Did you want to provide some details on what will be done this year for that, Chief Hollett? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Chief Council, uh, Roy Hollett, Deputy Fire Chief. Um, the, yes, the strategy is uh, divided into a number of areas. It's looking at uh, mitigation factors that we can put into place and work with Department of Natural Resources to uh, help prevent and or reduce the severity of the fires. So that's one component of it. Also looking at a training program to provide more training specific to wildland firefighting for structural firefighters. And the other component to it is adding equipment that we do not have. And that is based on working with many departments across the US and Canada, uh, what they put in place. And we're looking at similar programs. So the items that we're looking at are proven in other places and we're just trying to bring them here now. Okay, excellent, thank you for that. Go ahead, Chief. Thank you. Just to expand on Chief Hollett's comments, he's a little bit too modest. So I would remind, <coughs> sorry, I would remind Council that we are not the authority having jurisdiction for wildfires. So, but the problem is we are there first and we will be there till the end. So we have taken a different approach. When I first came here, I identified you know, that as one of the things that kept me up at night and we started working the problem. But working the problem when you are not the authority of jurisdiction is a challenge. So you need to develop a partnership with the agency who is the authority having jurisdiction, which in this case is DNRR. So we have worked closely to align ourselves better with DNRR and work on joint initiatives and improve our capabilities to be able to respond to those incidents. Chief Hall, it also represents all of Canada on the Wildfire Policy Committee, which is uh, meeting next uh, in two weeks, I think, in Reno, and uh, is leading uh, a wildfire policy committee here that we're establishing right now in Nova Scotia and is leading efforts across Canada to be the voice to work with authorities having jurisdiction. So there are two authorities that have jurisdiction in this, not just DNRR, but SIPSI in the federal government. So we are trying to access funds. We are trying to say this you know, affects our mission and we need to be resourced and trained to be able to do that work. So I think we do have a plan. We are working the plan. Uh, but it's 
you know, Rome was not built overnight. It's gonna take time. And these complex problems require partnerships to address. And you can see we have three of them as our strategic priorities. The one with the port, the one with DNRR, and the one with EHS, which leads me to your next question. So the conversation about medical calls, the fire service has been doing medical calls for as long as the fire service has been around. The challenge we have, again, is we are not the authority having jurisdiction for healthcare services. And in this province, that includes EMS. So uh, there are pressures on the healthcare system. I think we would have some big challenges with our first responders, particularly, you know, not just the career, but our volunteers who give of their time to go to their community in need, in a time of need, and to not send them from, to Mrs. Smith who is having chest pain or possibly a heart attack or little Billy who's choking on a peanut or uh, a car accident where somebody has been uh, hurt. A lot of times our medical calls are complicated by the fact that there's an accident as well, whether it's an industrial accident or a car accident. The reality is fire stations are strategically located and are already there to save lives from fire, this goes with our mission of saving lives. So why are we seeing the increase in call volume? I think the space is becoming more complicated. You've heard over and over that police are tied up on mental health calls. We get tied up on those calls too. We don't have the same role as police, but there are times we go to those calls. But we are supposed to go to higher acuity calls, i.e. people feeling, uh, dealing with a life and death situation, but we know that's not always the case. So when we are on those calls, it's one thing to send our resources out to a life-threatening call, but if it's not a life-threatening call, how do we get extricated from that call? And we are working with EHS to be able to do that because if we go to a call without a removal process, we would be charged with abandonment. So it is something we need to work with EHS on and that's why we have it in our plan to continue to work that relationship and the, we're starting to see the fruits of that labor uh, with them supporting our mission with cost savings on equipment to help them with their mission. Thank you very much. Thank you for that response, thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you very much for the presentation and I echo the accolades to all of the members of Halifax Fire and the work that's happened over the last year, which is really unprecedented and it's true. Um, so I have some very focused questions and of course, Metal Muscadabit is uh, top of the list and why? One of the comments was that um, as soon as the station is ready, so if you could explain to me what does that actually mean? I was very thrilled to sit at the firefighter graduation and I kept the pamphlet that said, here's the firefighters that are gonna be assigned to Middle Muscadabit and um, nobody's there and it's a year later. So our community is really worried. Um, and I do think that there's a bit of a crisis in the rural component when it comes to volunteer recruitment in uh, our stations. So. Um, wondering what does that mean in terms of it's not ready and what do we need to do to, to get it ready. And then when you look at the, the numbers, we've got 547 volunteer firefighters and 512 career. I'm wondering if you could tell me uh, in the volunteer firefighters, where is the biggest percentage of volunteer firefighters? Is it urban, is it suburban, is it rural? and does it meet the need? So where are all of those volunteer firefighters? Because when we think rural, we're not seeing it. And so I'm wondering about some very, what kind of targeted recruitment is happening to get uh, people rural. And then when I looked at the volunteer engagement survey, of course, it's not the same survey that is being done or provided to the professional firefighters. Is there a way to look at, and the uptake, uh, I've heard from volunteer firefighters that the uptake on that survey is not that great on the volunteer firefighter survey. So I'm just wondering about how that can change to get um, better information from our volunteers about what's working and what's not working and their retention um, and recruitment efforts and what it means. So those are my questions for now, thank you. Thank you, I'll call Deputy Chief Andrews. Uh, we've recently moved the uh, 
volunteer program into our ops pillar. So I'll ask Deputy Chief Andrews to come up and start to uh, frame his thoughts around your questions around the volunteer survey. I imagine he'll be connecting with one of our team at headquarters, but through the mayor to you, Councillor, on your questions. I will also ask uh, Philip, who's here from PFE, to come up and answer your questions, particularly around you know, where the building is in the process and what could be done to expedite it. Uh, certainly our goal is to staff it as soon as possible. Who gets to start? Good there morning. Go. Philip DeGanzik, Director of Facility Design and Construction, Property, Fleet and Environment. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. Uh, with respect to Fire Station 38, uh, we became aware of this project and the need to renovate that facility. Can't hear me? They're just going to oh. turn my mic off uh, so okay. I can't <laughs> We became aware of that project and the need to renovate that facility to uh, convert it to a 24-hour station in the spring of last year. And this wasn't originally on our work plan, so we had to work with fire to juggle some other pro other um, projects that we had on our work plan and prioritize this one. <clears throat> we undertook design work to, um, to renovate that facility, which is fairly significant. It requires uh, renovating sleeping quarters, upgrading washrooms, adding uh, commercial washer and dryer for uh, cleaning bunker gear. Um, that in itself required uh, significant electrical upgrades, mechanical system upgrades, uh, energy efficient Im efficiency improvements. So it's a fairly broad scope. It's a complicated project. We are almost finished with the design. It's going to be tendered. The tender should be issued uh, later this, mar this month uh, with a six-month construction period. So we'd be looking at the fall of 2024 for completion. Thank you. Was there other outstanding questions there? Yes. Chief? So while Peter prepares for your question on the um, r recruitment of volunteers and where they're located, uh, I've seen your eyebrows go up in spring. So that was when the budget was approved for the 15 firefighters. So to build the building, if we didn't get the firefighters, it was all tied to the budget. So when the budget was approved, we reached out the building and said, we're gonna need this building converted because those stations in the rural areas are typically built for a volunteer staffing model, not a 24 hour model. So uh, that's why it was spring. Your Worship, uh, through to the committee, thank you for the multitude of questions there. I'll try to capture uh, most of them. If I miss something, please uh, point me back. The uh, staffing of, uh, of Upper Muscadabit was approved last year in the 23-24 budget with uh, the strategy to onboard those employees in, in February, which we did on Monday, uh, and operational those, those uh, firefighters in the station in June-ish. Of, uh, of 2024. Uh, as you've already heard, there, uh, it required some uh, renovations to the station, particularly to take a station that was never uh, designed to house and live in firefighters. It was typically a volunteer response station. Uh, and uh, even with that, um, we are poised imminently to enhance some staffing there with some supplemental career staffing to help bridge uh, the gap that we have there waiting uh, till we fully operationalize this station. Uh, with respect to the volunteer engagement survey, if we look back to the last one we conducted in 20. Uh, 19, we had about 50% uh, respondents, so if the number of volunteers was approximately uh, 500, about 250 folks or so were respondents to that. Uh, we are proud to announce that we did uh, launch a second uh, volunteer en engagement survey that went out on Monday, and uh, as of today, five days into it, we're sitting at approximately 61 respondents to that uh, volunteer uh, survey. Uh, with respect to where our volunteers are and, and, and our challenges uh, with recruiting, um, 
I, I think we see success in recruiting and maintaining volunteer complements in areas where the population base supports it. Uh, we are very proud that we've had some success in some of our rural remote areas in attracting uh, uh, new candidates to those areas. We, we believe that is part of the growth that we are experiencing and we are starting to see more families and uh, adult age or firefighter age adults starting to move into those locations uh, as well as the hard work of our volunteer component uh, recruitment team to, to attract those folks. Um, we have a, a, a list for which we prioritize where we would like to focus our recruiting and uh, sadly in areas that are rural and remote we are still having uh, difficulty in recruiting and attracting volunteers uh, in those areas. Thank you Deputy. Uh, just to add to that, it, it is also complicated by the amount of recruits that we can actually train at a time, similar to what you heard from the President. So in the volunteer, like our training facility has only so much space in it and we can accommodate classes of 20. So while we have 20 in the career sector, in the volunteer sector, two times a year on the same cycle, we split our classes up so they run on opposite weekends. So we have 20 on this weekend and 20 on that weekend, which means we actually do groups of 40. So the max we could do for training in, in a year is 80. And you can see last year we did uh, 73, I think, in the presentation. And we have really, you know, done a lot of efforts to focus our recruitment. So if you have a volunteer who wants to join a volunteer station where we have a very healthy complement of volunteers, although we would like to bring them on board, we have to be picky to say we only have so many spots in our recruit class. So uh, we do absolutely focus the recruits that come on board in the communities in most in need. And we have seen successes. We have seen our trend go from constantly falling to rising over the last three years based on the policy changes and the recruitment efforts we've done. So I'm certainly proud of that effort and probably one of the few departments in Canada who have been identifying a change in that trajectory. But we also believe we need to be visible and in the community and connected to the community to draw people in. So we believe Middle Musket Abbott, when that goes 24 hours, will help. And it will help retain the volunteers we have because quite frankly, they're getting tired, right? Uh, we have seen that success in Sheet Harbor. Sheet Harbor went from a community where we had almost no volunteers to a community that is getting volunteers. And this is not, you know, an us and them conversation between career and volunteers because they are required to work together in those communities. And we've seen successes in Black Point and Goffs where we had nobody when I first came here. So we are improving, but we got to keep our nose to the grindstone and prioritize the, the limited space we have in our recruitment. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief, and uh, all the great staff uh, here today. Uh, you've had a heck of a year, and uh, you know I, I feel like you have to say that, even though you're hearing it from every single one of us. But it really was outstanding the work that was done and uh, how it was done, and I thank you for it. Uh, I also want to acknowledge. I feel like the quality of debate's gone down since Tyrus left, but we'll do the best <laughs> we can. Uh, and I have a message from Paul McKinnon from the Downtown Business Commission, who is going to present today, but he's uh, ill, and he uh, the email I got was that he knows. Council regrets not hearing from him as they do every year. Uh, but, but really, I also want to thank uh, the CAO, Kathy O'Toole, because I think what's happening with this budget makes the most sense I've ever seen in the time that I've been here. Uh, if Council says by policy, this is what we want from HRM, uh, from our staff, you should just come and tell us what that's going to cost. And then we have to consider, are we going to do what we said we're going to do or are we going to change the policy? And, that, and so this is a much better approach and I really appreciate it. Uh, it's ni nice to see the uh, changes around uh, service delivery and, and the focus on trying to get the new stations open, though I'm concerned the new stations are uh, taking too long to, to get open and get built. And that's more on us than it is on you, Chief. I'm just acknowledging it publicly, right? Like if we put more money into capital to build stations faster, we've been talking about a transformation of where stations are located. I think about Sackville, I think about Bedford. And we haven't 
been able to get that done. I mean, the, the setup on what we're seeing now, the transformation we're seeing now, started when Steve Craig was still on council. It takes a long time to build these policies and to build these, uh, uh, you know, strategic visions. But I feel like we're at risk now of seeing a lot of red dots and being pressured to hire even more firefighters. We have to hire more firefighters, and I support that. The population's growing, the service calls are going up, but the ability to efficiently deploy them is impacted by not having the fire stations in the right place for as the population grows. And that potentially puts the pressure on us to spend money on even more firefighters to get them out there faster, to have more people on the road when we haven't been able to get there yet. So, um, you know, I have concerns about that, uh, and certainly uh, Councillor Lovelace's motion that's coming up, you know, our policy says that when a certain population threshold is, is met, that we should have 247 stations, and, and we know we're there in Tantallon, and, and, and we know there's other places that we've gotten there, and I think that we should be looking to meet our goals to do what we said and uh, say what we're going to do. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, what is interesting about the discussion today, also colleagues on council, is we don't see fire that often, right? right? We don't. It's not like Board of Police Commissioners, it's not like uh, Public Works and AT reporting to Transportation Standing Committee. And I think this is really outlining to me, like underlining and putting stars and dots around it, why uh, the motion that I made two months ago at Executive Standing Committee, uh, I can't wait for us to make those changes, that community safety and the relationship to the Board of Police Commissioners and fire should be coming there, because I feel like there's lots of operational discussions we would like to have with you, mm -hmm. and trying to smoosh them all into the budget mm -hmm. uh, doesn't serve you and doesn't serve us, so I, I can't wait for that change to happen. I do have some questions. On the medical calls piece you already addressed, uh, I feel like part of this is the struggle they're having with EHS and with admissions at, at hospitals, right? I mean, like, but I wonder, is there a model other firefighter, firefighting uh, forces have had uh, is it always the right thing to be sending a fire truck to a medical call? I'm not saying we should start our own emergency services to match EHS, but it does seem like we're backstopping them with very expensive equipment with a very specific set of training, and that if they're out doing medical calls, that that's going to impact our ability to respond to fires and major accidents. Uh, second uh, question was around the alarm activations. Do we have an education plan around that? I emailed you recently, Chief, about a not-for-profit that was upset about their fines, and you responded completely fine, and, and, and I said to them, you just have to go through the process, and they're probably gonna have to pay those fines. But ultimately, if like it's a very big concern to see that much resource, those many resources being uh, consumed there. Uh, and in the 37 seconds I have left, you didn't talk about the boat at all. We spent a lot of mine. We talked a lot about the boat the last two or three years. I'd love to hear how the boat's going because I, I, that's a lot of resources and a lot of money we put into that. And, and I'd like to know: is it being used? Is it going out? How's it? You know, how's the trading? All that kind of stuff. And then finally, on traffic calming, it's got to be said we have way more pedestrian collisions than we do uh, injuries from, from fire. So I'm wondering how you're feeling now about the stuff that you, I know you're directly involved now with the committee. How are you feeling about the things like the speed tables they built at Turner Drive and the experiments that they've done to try and accommodate both the needs of the speed cushions of dropping pedestrian injuries and fatalities while also being able to provide uh, you know, high quality fire service, because it's, it's a bit of a trade-off, but we want to try and, you know, maintain one while bringing down the other number. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the question through the mayor to you, Councillor. Uh, some good questions for sure. Uh, I'll maybe talk, first of all, about your comments about the medical call pressures and, uh, let you know that that's exactly why we're in the dialogue we're in with with EHS. Uh, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So we have big fire apparatus that are designed to respond to fire emergencies. And historically, the fire department has used those calls to go to medical calls. The challenge is we also typically have four people on those calls. So on those trucks. So we're sending a lot of resources and it's one thing to go uh, to a medical call that's a life-threatening situation 
to save a life. It's another to go to a call that ended up not being life-threatening, and now you have four people committed to that event. So the conversations with EHS are, uh, and, it, and it's complicated because you need, you know, medical oversight, you need quality improvement and quality assurance initiatives and documentation and transfer of patient care. There's all kinds of pieces of the puzzle. Remember, I'm also a critical care flight paramedic. So we want to work better in this space and we want to make sure we do it right. So every step forward is very deliberate and it's based on evidence-based practice. So we are looking to implement new solutions in partnership with EHS that will help us be there when needed, support our partners, make a difference, uh, saving lives in the community and try to wherever possible keep ourselves available for the other part of our mission, um, which includes the ability to do treatment, and no transports possibly, to release from calls, uh, and to work differently than we do now. And we're even uh, looking at uh, conversations with EHS about the possibility of doing some of these changes in our service delivery model in uh, a research initiative to make sure that we have a research question and we validate what we're doing. Not just do it because Ken thinks it's a good idea, that the evidence supports the pivot. So uh, I can't really say much more about that right now because it is a conversation that we continue to have with EHS. And as you can see, we are seeing movement in that space. Uh, public education, your comment on public education. Uh, our provincial legislation is very weak in this province when it comes to fire service delivery. So we rely on council for a lot of the directions uh, that you give us on our emergency uh, and public education requirements. And you have got public education in our administrative order, although in other jurisdiction, it's actually required by law legislatively in the province. So we are working to implement new uh, public education abilities with our union in the restructure of our branch and hope uh, to get that done in the very, very near future. Uh, certainly that is work that's in in progress to be able to kind of swim upstream and deal with calls before they happen. And that also is on the medical side, right? Trying to prevent somebody from hitting crisis. And in this case, you're talking about fire alarms. The traffic calming measures. So I just put them all in one big category. Speed humps, speed bumps, speed pillows, speed cushions, speed tables, bump outs, whatever they are. I sat in this council chamber and I was asked by Councillor Walker, do you have a concern with traffic calming? And my comment to the council was, I understand you're trying to balance public safety over here with traffic calming measures, but if they are designed by nature to show, slow down traffic, the answer I think is pretty clear from our perspective, they are a challenge for us. We are getting to the point where, and I have said that publicly, and we are getting to the point, and the administrative order requires fire to sign off on them, right? But it's one thing to get a street at a time. What about this street? What about, you know, prove that one, prove this one, prove this one. What we need to know is the whole gestalt, right? The whole picture and understand how it affects us. So just so you understand some of our challenges, our volunteer firefighters have to go over traffic calming measures to get to the fire station. Then they need to go through traffic calming measures to go out to the call. If they require water shuttle, every time they move the truck, they're going over traffic calming measures. Our career folks are getting to the point where intersections can't clear because of the bump outs at the intersection. They might be able to fit down the lane but they can't have the lane clear in front of them because they can't get around the bump out. So I'm not saying traffic calming is bad. What I'm saying is we need to take a look at the whole picture in partnership with Public Works. That's why Brad and I have committed to working together this year to take a look at the traffic calming strategy and the inner mobility plan and how that all ties in to emergency response time targets. I'll remind council that our first in truck times, which is actually our best performance, 
is getting the truck from the station to the emergency, whether it's a medical emergency or a fire emergency within a certain amount of time. We've picked a five minute drive time in an urban footprint. Everywhere else in North America, they have a four minute drive time. The reason we you know, suggested you stay with five is in order to switch from five to four, you would have to build all new stations and they'd all have to be closer together. And even though five minute drive time is our best performance measure, it's getting harder and harder and harder to achieve. And the effective firefighting force requires the second, third, and fourth station to get to that call, which are going over exponentially more traffic calming measures to get to the call. That's why we think that, you know, how red is the red dot diagram is demonstrating that the, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, up to 14 firefighter is getting harder to achieve. I, I can't say that you know, based on data, that's why we're gonna do this project, right. to actually have the data to say, is it in fact affecting our response time? We believe it is, and we're getting to the point where our routes are becoming narrower and narrower. What I mean by narrower and narrower is that's traffic, we can't use that street because there's traffic calming measures, we can't use that street. So our ability to navigate to a call is getting harder and harder. And when you have snow on traffic on top of narrowed streets, this last year, I could hardly get my Durango down a street by IWK. I don't know how our crews, they never would have been able to fit down there. So yeah, it is a challenge and that's why we have it in the initiative. And the boat. The boat, uh, so certainly, um, this is uh, a big investment by council. I'll remind council, I don't, have the last year's numbers off, off the top of my head, but we on average respond to 36 calls uh, a year in the boat. So more than two a month, and they go to, you know, people who've fallen off the ferry or off a boat or, you know, uh, have maybe gotten into the water through some other means uh, or uh, fires on the shore. So we use the boat more than expected and it is part of the conversation we're having on the port about what that vessel could be used for with uh, you know port risk reduction strategy. But just so you know, it, we would need a much bigger vessel in conversation with the port to be able to fight a shipboard fire. Yep. So, and we don't see that being an HRM tax burden. We see that as an investment uh, by our partners if we move forward on that. But it's certainly better than what we had and it is a very reliable vessel and our crews are now protected from the elements in the winter, which they never were in the past. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Um, this is a good segue actually into my points and, and concern. I wanna start with though um, iterating as well as my colleagues uh, on the, the thank you the, um, to your team, your volunteer teams or community uh, champions for firefighting because it's not just uh, those of us that are in here. Um, and that your commitment to Shelburne, it's my hometown. I had many family members who involved in that fire, including my brother who worked with DNR as firefighter. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm going to um, drill right down to this budget request because that's, that's what's on the floor today for us to vote on. And uh, your, your um, passionate plea right now is the first time that I've heard it to the degree that I think that I, that it's been presented this way around the traffic calming piece. It gives me great concern, that piece, because of course we've leaned on that on so many levels for so many years on being the solution to our concerns that residents raise around traffic and, and we've heard it now and then. I've never heard it this way as well articulated today on the concerns of our, of our emergency uh, crews. So, um, so there's two things here that you mentioned while in that response to Councillor Mason, it's the red dots. And, and I, when, I, when, when you did your presentation, the red dots, when I hear we were not able to respond and performance is down, it, it, it just, it sits with me. And so what I need to hear from you today to help me make a decision is, help me understand what those red dots are again, please. That's the first, the first start. 
and, and why are we there, but more importantly, what in this budget request is gonna help us bring those red dots, shrink those, re those red dots? Um, is it the street traffic calming? Is it, what is it in this budget that we have to consider that is about helping to reduce those and, and facilitate the efforts that you need to do to improve on that. Of course, you know, we can't, we are trying to predict growth. We are trying to resolve issues with um, many different capacities of street safety and such that that is potentially problematic for you. So I really need something that helps me understand today what is it in, in our request today that is going to make the biggest impact? If that's where you need it to be, just help. And maybe it's the, maybe I've not heard it as well as I should have on the red dots, but help me understand that if you would. Thank you for your question through the mayor to the councillor. Okay, so there are many things that turn a red dot into a red dot versus a blue dot if we just want to use that analogy. Yeah. So to answer your first question, what does the red dot mean? A red dot means we were not able to get 14 firefighters there in the expected time that council would expect based on our administrative order, which is based on an industry best practice. Um, the reason that the numbers are what they are in the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association standards, which are called 1710 for urban departments, is because there are many tasks that need to be done in, you know, simultaneously when a crew arrives. You need incident command to set up, you need a driver to operate the pump and get the water flowing, you need attack crews to take a hose into a building, you need backup crews to back up the crews going into the dangerous to the life environment, you need rescue crews to enter the building, not for fire control, but to rescue people, you need to ventilate the building, you need to protect the exposures around it, and then you may need to shuttle water. So there are many functions that require all hands on deck within a certain amount of time to successfully keep the fire in a perfect world in the room of origin. So if the fire starts in the kitchen because somebody left a pot in the stove and people are sleeping in their bedroom, those response times are meant to be able to get the crew there in time to stop the fire from spreading to outside the room of origin and possibly hitting a point where the whole building just bursts into flames, which you know uh, is earmarked at somewhere between two and six minutes, depending on the intensity of the fire and the building construction uh, of the building. So our goal is always to get those folks there. And when you come in onesies and twosies, uh, you put your firefighters at risk, making a decision to go into a building that is not safe to go into to effect a rescue. That's why we respond with four people on a crew. But unlike most metropolitan departments, we don't have many stations that have more than one truck in them. So we require multiple stations to respond to a call, like no less than three or four. So the only exceptions to that are really, you know, right now we happen to have an extra truck in Bedford and Sackville, happen to have until West Bedford is built. Uh, but really, save and accept them, it's station 12 and station three in downtown Halifax, which are stations that have two trucks. So when you have two trucks in that station, you're already starting with resources of consequence and then you need one or two other stations to respond, not three or four. So if your stations are coming from a longer distance and needing to go through traffic calming measures or whatever, uh, the, the challenges exist to get them there on time. And what else creates red dots to stay red? or what could we do to change a red dot from a blue dot might be a better way to state it, is technology would be the first low-lying fruit. That's why I continue to press that we need technology to be part of the solution. It is the most 
cost-effective return on investment. I am amazed that we don't have station alerting technology in a department our size. We expect to harness 30 seconds of savings in response time, uh, just implementing that technology. Dispatch by apparatus for a major metropolitan department is still not available to us. What that means is currently we dispatch resources to a call based on their station location. But if they're not in their station, how do you know they're the closest resource? We have automatic vehicle locators in our truck, but currently they are not connected to the CAD, the computer-aided dispatch system in the dispatch center. So the CAD doesn't know where they are. They're assuming they're in the station. But if I'm over here and the other crew is over here, they should have been sent to the call, which our dots are all based on past performance, not predictive performance. That's what we actually achieved. So if we have technology to make sure we're getting the fastest resource to the call in the best amount of time, then we can say we've done that work. Then we need to make sure traffic calming doesn't create a problem, you know, extraordinary problem, one that we can't work with. And then we also need to take a look at station locations and staffing. The reason they're important is it's all based on drive time. So if you do a new development that's gonna brought, bring, you know, 30,000 people to a community and have, you know, five, 10, 15,000 calls a year, and we haven't built a station in that community and we're driving from the last station that we had from 30 years ago, then we shouldn't be surprised that we can't get there in time. So the only real answer is, you know, outside of the techno technology helping make that change and taking a look at our driving networks is station location and staffing and call volume. So every time we're tied up on a call means that crew can't go to the next call. So our job is constantly trying to free up from the call we're on so we're available for the next one. That's why the work with EHS is important because it's the vast majority of our call volume. Does that help answer your question? I hope I, it does. I would, if, with Mr. Mayor's indulgence, I would like a little more on what is it in this budget that's actually gonna give you that. You can have another t two minutes, we'll take you to an even 20 minutes, so. <laughs> <laughs> so specifically this time, we have in the budget, the conversion of Tin Talon area to a 24 hour station. So that is in keeping with the West Bedford build. So the West Bedford build will help us have more firefighters in the West Bedford area and Bedford and be able to support station seven in Nitridge and also in Sackville. But that whole area, the population density is at, last I heard, 99.4. That was a year ago, so I'm assuming we're very close to 100 if we're not past it. We need the 24-hour response to hit the first in truck. When I say 24-hour response, I'm saying 24-hour career response with firefighters in the station. Because the only way to get that response time is have firefighters in the station. So. The first in truck can be achieved by turning that one station, one of those stations into a 24 hour station. And we are still reviewing the data as I said, but that will also, if it's in the right location, be able to back up West Bedford, which requires those 14 firefighters and we can pretty much never get them based on the red dots. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Morris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Chief, and a big thank you to the entire service. Uh, it was not only outstanding work um, in unprecedented emergencies last year, um, but you're also working at the leading edge to apply the learnings and benefit people across the country. So thank you for all that work. Um, I'm wondering, again, on the medical coverage issue, um, I'm trying to understand what the impact is. I, I heard about an incident at the Canada Games Centre just as one example, um, where there was a 911 call, and apparently fire was there uh, instantly, was the description of the response, and EHS uh, was there 45 minutes after the call. 
So what impact does this have when fire is arriving so much ahead of EHS? And are we measuring all that and, and the cost of that um, time? Um, and I guess we're all uh, here on council, we're concerned about the various services that um, you know, we're filling in gaps um, in provincial services. Uh, we're concerned about um, downloading and that sort of thing. And so how, is, how can that be measured and recognized, I guess, going forward? Um, and also uh, on a, a separate issue on the recruiting and training and that sort of thing, how much of the new hires are experienced firefighters from other jurisdictions and how much of the hiring is in-house trainees? And I'm asking about that because I would assume that there would be benefits in hiring people who have experience in firefighting from other jurisdictions and that there's some value in that. Of course, I understand it's a, a very comprehensive training that we do in-house, but what is the balance there in terms of younger new recruits and older, more experienced uh, folks to be hired. Thank you. Thank you for the question through the mayor to you, Councillor. Um, so to, on your first comment about do we track and measure the amount of time, I guess, that we're committed to a medical call, and what is the value? We've never estimated what, or you know, calculated what the value of that time is, because our intention is to go fulfill our mission to save a life. So uh, the challenge is when we get there, and then we're waiting for the medical response. And if it's a life-threatening call, and we're doing CPR, nobody's complaining, right? But and we have had successes with defibrillations and got return of a pulse and spontaneous circulation while we're waiting for EMS to arrive. So uh, I don't, I certainly would not advocate that that's a waste of taxpayers' dollars. That's the whole reason we exist and to say that you're not gonna go to the, med I'm not suggesting you're saying this, to not go to a medical call to save a life because you're waiting for a fire call doesn't really kind of make sense. So I think we all acknowledge that we go to those calls and it is not uncommon in the medical world right across the country where I was in, uh, where I was responsible for uh, dispatching the right resource to the right call in a, in a large metropolitan department. What I mean by that is only sending assets when you need to send assets. So the challenge we have is it is common in the medical world that calls are over triaged, meaning we think based on the conversation, we don't even run the dispatch center, but based on the interrogation by the call taker, that this is a critical call. So we roll resources, EMS rolls resources, sometimes police rules, rolls resources, and we get there and they're not as bad as what you thought they'd be. So that becomes the challenge, how to release from those calls. Those are the conversations we're having with EHS. And you know, kind of a rule of thumb is the higher level training you have, the more ability medical uh, jurisdiction will allow you to release from the call based on your ability to make a clinical assessment. So our goal is to raise our level of training so that when we say they're fine, they believe us that they're fine, right? So that takes work to develop that trust. And by moving the ball forward, doing that, we actually then will be able to provide better train, you know, better skills when we get to the call. So uh, just a, a rough rule of thumb is it has been validated in other research initiatives that have gone on. Your chance of survivability, if you do not have a perfusing rhythm to your heart uh, and to your brain, is your chance of survivability drops by 10% every minute that you don't have a perfusing pulse. So our objective is to get there as quickly as possible to break, you know, to, to stop the clock ticking on, on that situation and restore a perfusing rhythm, whether that's through CPR, defibrillation, or stop a gross bleed from uh, exsanguinating somebody and losing their pulse. So there is all kinds of, you know, 
clearing a blocked airway. There's all kinds of medical emergencies, but it's all based on the premise that we're trying to keep them as a viable patient. Um, so uh, hopefully that helps answer your questions. As far as the, and, uh, hiring experienced firefighters, we don't currently uh, have a special recruitment for experienced firefighters. If we ever got to a point where we had a mass need to onboard significant portions of firefighters beyond our recruitment capabilities, we might very well say, hey, maybe we should do an expedited hiring process. Our hiring process focuses on values of individuals to be part of our inclusive and diverse workforce that represent our community. Because we don't require you to be a trained firefighter, all the departments, there's not many people, not many departments that train firefighters from the ground up anymore like we do, and they're all coming to us and say, how is your department becoming so diverse? Well, part of the reason it's becoming diverse is we don't say you have to be a graduate from a firefighter school because typically the people going into those schools are from affluent families, typically young white males, which means the only graduates are young white males. And then you wonder why your department's not getting diverse. So we pick the values of the people we hire. They need to demonstrate they have the ability to do the job and the physical ability to do the job, but we're picking them based on their values and then we train them to be firefighters. So. Uh, but even if we were to train them or take train firefighters, most departments have what they call an orientation program, which is only a few weeks shorter than ours. So we blitz training for four months. They eat, breathe, and sleep it, but most major departments, you know, have an orientation process that's 12 to 14 weeks long. So they train them almost as long, or at least half as long, and we have a complicated service delivery model. And what I mean by complicated is we not only have an urban environment, we have a suburb, suburban environment, we have a rural and we have a rural remote. We have wildland urban interface problems, we have a harbor, we have a hazmat team, we have a tech rescue team. So if you came from Toronto Fire Department, what do you know about wildland urban interface? Like nothing, right? So. That's why the training for your department is important. They need to know how to do tanker shuttle certification. Why? Because we requ require tankers in 80% of our geography to flow water. That doesn't happen in, you know, Windsor Fire Department and Vancouver Fire Department. They don't use tankers. So uh, even if we did training or take trained firefighters, there would still be training required to onboard them. Okay, thanks Chief. And and just to clarify on my first question, I didn't mean to suggest that uh, <laughs> there's a, a monetary value in having the fire department arrive first. I just mean that uh, I want to make sure that, that uh, fire service is recognized um, for all the work being done to support EHS. Thank you. It's too late, Councillor. It's on Twitter now. I'm not to deal with it. <laughs> Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Chief. Um, would I be correct in that uh, I imagine you, one of your highest volume calls would be responding to motor vehicle accidents? Mayor, to the council, we're just gonna look at I know it's up there, but I don't know <laughs> if it's number two. So that would be on slide number five, uh, that would be the green line, the dark green line, which would make it our fourth highest uh, call type. I don't have it in front of me on my screen, so like how many calls, just approximate. 2,000-ish. Uh, 2,000 calls for motor vehicle crashes a year, okay. Which are a lot on highways as well. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, the point I'm driving towards, as maybe you're guessing, um, it, no pun intended, is, you know, you know, I'm a little concerned with what I'm hearing about traffic calming here because, um, you know, I flip back to Brad's presentation and 
in the term of this council, we've had 39 people die on our streets. And we've had each year, if you throw in injuries, we've had hundreds of people um, injured on our streets. Um, you know, and that's no small thing. I, in my district, literally just this week, I was asking our traffic folks, as I was looking at the traffic map, because I had yet another request about Creighton Avenue, um, where we've got this super, super wide street where you could probably drive three fire trucks abreast up the middle of it. Um, through the middle section, and um, it was taken off the traffic calming list because fire has rejected any changes to that street. So that's kind of disappointing because the pressure and the speeds on that street are not safe. Um, so I appreciate that you're going to do this work with Brad and, and public works, but you know, the planner on me putting on my planner hat. I think you know if we are trying to fit road safety to fire trucks rather than designing fire trucks to fit the streets, that's really going at this problem really ass backwards. Like we should be looking at the equipment that we have. And so my question really fundamentally on this is instead of just a response time piece, because you know they have fires in old cities in Europe, they have fires in cities in Japan, um, and they don't have giant North American style fire trucks. And so have we actually looked at the equipment that we are using to deal with, the, with our, you know, to, to, in response? as part of our exercise, because I think if we're only looking at road design, we're missing a huge chunk of the forest and focusing on a couple of trees. Through the mayor to you, Councillor, I am really glad you asked that question. <laughs> so that would be uh, certainly my strategy to include vehicles. Uh, I'll remind Council, I don't need to remind you of our uh, desire to reduce our effects on climate change. And I have uh, sent him, for, we don't manage our fleet, for, so first of all, I would say that. Uh, and second of all, we are, you know, although we are not a small department, you know, manufacturers are not going to adopt to what we say. Uh, there are different vehicle standards in different countries, as you know. We subscribe and have, you know, typically follow NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, which is North American by design. But I have continued to push manufacturers in this space to reduce the footprint, so to speak, of the truck itself. But we also need to consider the water supply system that is set up in our hydrants. It's not as simple like the pumps that are in the trucks need to match the hydrants, right? And we also have communities that have no water supply, so then we need trucks that carry a lot of water in the back of them. European doesn't deal with our suburban and rural and our rural remote challenges of water supply. Like our trucks are carrying at minimum 500 gallons of water in them, right? Because we are not having a hydrant on every single corner that we go to. So compressing the footprint of what we actually need is important, but and I think Chief, it, Chief, I'm sorry to interrupt. I've got about seven seconds. I want to throw this in, but like when we have an urban and a suburban and a rural, yeah, you need that big tanker truck down in Muscatahoban and Sheet Harbor, but you don't necessarily need the same size truck to respond in downtown Dartmouth as you do out there, where the conditions are vastly different. I was going to get to that point. Okay, so, sorry. Uh, I, I so was just worried I wouldn't it, get to slip it, it in. It includes <laughs> how we buy trucks moving forward and how trucks live their life in HRFE. Because typically, historically, we've bought trucks, put them in busy stations for the first part of their life until their warranty wears off, and then maybe kind of retire them in a slower station. So all of that needs to be factored. But I think a major opportunity is with electrification. We have already got to make changes to the types of trucks we buy. And there are two kind of concepts out there. One is the North American truck, which basically took the same size uh, apparatus and took out the engine, put a diesel generator inside it and a bunch of batteries, and the truck itself looks no different. 
It has a terrible turning radius, it's wide. If you take a look at the North, the, uh, the European model, which is made by Rosenbauer, which is being implemented in Vancouver and Burlington and other departments, that is a four wheel steering apparatus. It is narrower, it is shorter, it is lower to the ground for a profile. I think what we need to do as part of our electrification is trial both models and say, which one works best, right? So I think you're not wrong in that that has got to be part of the solution. Uh, I'm not suggesting traffic calming stops. What I'm saying is we need to understand the uh, effects and you know work with Brad's team to deal with the kind of entirety of the strategy. But I would also, well, you brought up MVCs as a criteria. I would also bring up that we go to, you know, over 4,000 medical calls. And like I said, our objective is to get there in the shortest period of time so that we can save that 10% loss of life uh, for every minute we're delayed. So uh, I don't have, you know, the number right off the top of our head, but we go to almost one VSA, that's a vital signs absence call where somebody has no pulse almost every day. So every day we're going to calls where somebody is, you know, on death's door. So we're not potentially trying to save a life. That is a life that's already in peril. So what we're trying to do is balance in a report coming back to council, what do you want to do about traffic calming versus response times? Because we can't keep squeezing the streets and wondering why we can't get there. Councillor and Chief, I'm going to stop you uh, there. Uh, <laughs> I am going to note, Councillor, that you used a terminology that uh, I, that's the strongest words I've heard you use in council. I'm not going to say the word again, but in the dictionary it's defined as a colloquial term. Uh, which means moving backwards, that is rear end first. I don't know if it's parliamentary, but since it came from you, I allow it. So, Councillor Outhis. What I usually say is back ass words, and that keeps me out of trouble. I'm not quite as parliamentary as Sam, I guess, but, uh, and listen, thank you, Chief. I always learn something from you. We have phone conversations, budget presentations, and the same with, with Brendan as well. I always learn things. And, you know, we talk about this medical uh, response, which I strongly support. I had a situation in my own family 11 years ago. My mother had a heart attack, dropped dead on the floor in Clayton Park at my sister's home, and it was 25, 30 minutes before uh, uh, first the ambulance got there. I don't know why, or if the time for why we weren't doing medical responses, I think. Uh, it may have cost, and, and yeah, I, I loved, I loved my mother like all humans and there are mornings when I wake up thinking about that. I, you know, if we'd gotten somebody there sooner, my chief had more time. But you know, so I think we're doing the right thing for the right reasons. Um, when are we going to do a nice sod turning at West Bedford? That's my first question. It's high time. I think people don't believe that uh, it's happening, I think, until they see some of our smiling faces there, perhaps turning a sod or doing something. Um, I wrote down here, and Sam, I, I couldn't be more in agreement with you uh, on your comments there a few moments ago. I actually wrote down, let's not trade, let's not treat red dots with a red herring. Because I am so worried that traffic calming is the red herring in this, where the problem of response times are station locations, plowing standards, access to water, as we'll hear from from Pam, getting the boots on people quicker and out of the station faster, uh, the right sized equipment, as, as Sam mentioned, and what you just mentioned, the, the paging and the technology that knocks 30 seconds or more off this. This is what I'm so concerned. You know, I look at my neighborhood. You come out of Convoy Run, you come along the Bedford Highway, you go up the Dartmouth Road, you come into Ridgevale Drive. No traffic calming anywhere there probably until you get to, and hopefully Ridgevale Drive will see a couple of speed humps this year. So the last block or two of a place that sees a fire truck once every five or 10 years versus hundreds and thousands of cars a day driving irresponsibly, and we don't have the ability yet to do photo radar and red light cameras and whatnot that might take some of the stress off our need to, to put speed bumps and whatnot. I think it's a red herring. And I think we have to be careful of that. 
I agree with you completely, though. If we were narrowing and slowing Dartmouth Road, Convoy Run, the Bedford Highway, all those sorts of things. But the last couple of blocks for a, a, a residential street that hardly ever sees a fire truck but has a, a raging problem with dangerous and irresponsible driving, I don't think is the problem. I think the problem is the station locations, the plowing standards. You know, downtown, if your Durango couldn't get up the street, then either there was a parking issue, a plowing issue, or your Durango's too big. <laughs> okay, and you know, there, 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 it, it, we've got to we've got to look at this. And I'm, from what I'm hearing from you, Chief, this is exactly what you're uh, what you're doing. And I wish we had other ways of controlling the traffic issues, as I mentioned, the photo radar and the red light cameras and whatnot, which may come and may help. But anyway, I have been, on the 16 years here, I've had nothing but tremendous support for you and your, pro and your predecessors and all the people you recommend, uh, rec represent, and the same with Brendan. And I'm going to be, I think, supportive of uh, the motion that Pam brings forward. Uh, I think what we had in the past was in the last few months of a, of a mandate of a council, we had a former chief come forward and say, bring in an alarm bell that we had stations in the wrong location. And we crucified them. We, we crucified them because we all thought we were gonna die in our beds because we either had an empty fire station with no equipment in it, the wrong equipment in it, but that's safer than closing a station and having a more central approach. So it, I've, I've never, and, and frankly, the union buggered up on that one too, pre, pre, previous uh, union leader. They, they, they fought to keep stations open in the wrong locations. And I hope that will change because we have to, while still controlling the speeds and, and conditions in our neighborhoods, we have to make sure we have the right equipment, the right water supply, the right locations of stations, four at a time, which we've all supplied on a truck at a time that we've all around this table fought and supported. That I'm hoping, Chief, will be your focus, not on a few speed bumps on a few side streets. Thank you, Councillor. Chief, anything on that? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. Um, the plan that Brad and I have talked about is use evidence to yeah. inform uh, council on what you'd like to do on the path forward. The reality is we have a tool that will analyze our responses. And if we assign, like just as this is me talking out loud, if we have the ability, which we can, to say what what penalty should be applied to a response time with a speed bump versus a speed hump versus a speed table versus a speed cushion versus a penalty or a bump out. We should be able to use our GIS data and our actual responses to say, this is what the red dots would have looked like before. This is what they look like after. Now, there might be other solutions to that, right? Put stations closer together, put more staff in a station, right? And I'm not suggesting I know the answer. I, I'm not, I'm saying this is work we're gonna do this year to look at it because what I'm saying we're struggling with right now is we get the streets one at a time and say, is this one a problem? Is this one a problem? Well, is this one? That one street at a problem might not be a problem, but when you attach it to that street and that street and that street, and how do we know where we are as we get busier when the call comes in if we're not in the station? Right. So that's really what I'm trying to say is we want to do an evidence-based approach to give the information to council and let you make the decision. I'm, I'm fortunate, I told you at the beginning of this, you have a tough job, right? You're the one that deals with these, you know, competing priorities. Uh, I'm not saying I disagree with traffic calming measures. What I'm trying to say is it's getting harder and harder to get around in the city sure. and it's making it harder and harder for us to get our crews there in a timely manner. And I'm not blaming anybody for that. I'm just saying we want to make sure we understand the situation and plan for the future. And that's, and that's comforting. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you, you, you very much. Okay, I think folks are going to take our break now. We're averaging about nine minutes per question, so um, we're not. Uh, we may as well take a break now and come back at one o'clock with Councillor Purdy, Councillor. Smith and, uh, and uh, myself and perhaps others and then second round. So thank you, Chief, to you and your team. Uh, uh, colleagues will uh, come back at one o'clock.
Okay, folks. We are back. We are debating the um, Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency uh, Budget. Uh, uh, discussion is ongoing. And um, Councillor Purdy, if you're good, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thanks, everyone. I'll let everyone take their seat. Okay, so I also want to echo my colleagues. Thanks in uh, the amazing response to the horrendous fires that we had this summer. I mean, we were all just impressed and amazed with the response of the group and EMO and just everyone doing everything that they could to uh, work on behalf of our residents. So thank you for that. I also um, just, I want to respond to your comments on the, the impacts of traffic calming. And I mean, I've, I've been pretty vocal about the concerns I've had uh, surrounding our IMP which, I mean, has great ideas in it, but I found in Coal Harbor, at least, uh, it doesn't really work well practically when you actually make the infrastructure changes and then um, uh, it, it, it just doesn't roll out well. Um, I've even heard from fire, uh, retired fire in my district with very grave concerns, uh, street narrowing, um, uh, intersection, like ma making intersections smaller and more more concise, so, so not having uh, adequate room. I've even heard from professional truck drivers who drive all over North America, giving me their measurements of how it's just inconceivable. Why why would why would the municipality do this? So yes, there's been a lot a lot of feedback of of concern um, around these things, and then of course we've just recently heard in TSC. Some other concerns about, in particular, traffic calming and the, I don't want to say misappropriation of, of our, the funds that we have, but we, we're funding streets that have very low risks, and then the streets that are, are higher risk streets we're, we're not able to just because of the, the policy. So for example, the majority of our fatal and injury collisions occur within major collector and arterial roadways. Um, so the implication of that is we are actually investing towards low impact countermeasures. So not really having an impact on safety. And it's also been told to me by many folks who are way smarter than me in, in this stuff, but people's speed perception when they are not in a vehicle is way off. So you think a car is going way faster than it is when you're not in a vehicle yourself. It just, it appears to be going faster than it is. So people's complaints and perceived safety concerns may not actually, well, I mean, they may or may not um, be real. It could be based on a faulty perception just because of our dynamics there. So like moving forward, we need, it, you know, as, as council, we need to carefully consider this balance of vulnerable road users on streets with low collision numbers to no collision numbers versus high collision focus areas. So that, so, and, and the concerns of fire in terms of not meeting times of the, the risks that increase when the uh, response times are compromised. I, I, I also wonder why, why we put traffic calming on streets with sidewalks, that, that's another thing. But I, I really think our IMP needs to be reassessed. I, I really do, because now that we actually have infrastructure that has been changed according to the IMP uh, regulations, we have, like, is it working? Is it increasing or is it decreasing? Our, our collisions, how, how is it all working in one big happy family of our big municipality? And I do think our IMP should be looked at regarding the different regions of our municipality. I don't think a one size fits all strategy for road use works. And I, I think we're seeing that right now. So um, your comment on working with Brad and Public Works to get a broad idea of how this whole network strategy will impact the fire services, um, I think is brilliant. However, on our 24 and 25 budget, we have already approved 
um, 105 more streets for traffic calming for this coming year. So if you already don't have a good understanding of what we've already done thus far and the impacts it will have to your emergency response, and we're about to just do 105 more streets, I mean, whoa, something needs to, something needs to give here. So I, I have a briefing note that I'm going to ask that we consider, and I'll just read it to uh, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a briefing note outlining potential savings for pausing, pausing all traffic calming measures for 24-25 until work between Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency and Transportation and Public Works have been completed as a funding option on the budget adjustment list, uh, the BAL for the bu uh, Budget Committee to consider in the 24-25 budget. Okay, so that's a motion of uh, Councillor Purdy. Is there a second for that? No one's going to second? Is there a seconder okay. for the motion? Well, that's great. Well, no, no apparently no not. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Smith. Thanks, Mike. Mayor Mike. <laughs> <laughs> you are on your way out. Yeah, you're on, yeah, you're I guess. on your way out. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, come on. Oh, next man God. up, next woman yeah, up, yeah, <laughs> next yeah. mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess it's a good day to call you, Mike. Uh, so, so as everybody mentioned, you know, thank you to everyone involved in, in responding to all issues in the municipality. Uh, relate to fire and, and other. So uh, I'm, I'm not gonna repeat other than thank you. So two quick questions. One, um, just to kind of go on the points that Councillor Austin brought up around uh, the modified trucks. I don't believe there's ever been direction given. I know you've had this since you've come here, you've talked about you know new, new two types of, of truck sizes, um, technology. I know that's something that you've been very adamant about, but I don't think there's ever been like direction to really take that into vest investigation. So one question is wondering like, would it help if council gave you direction to really dig deep into that discussion of modified trucks related to traffic calming, uh, electrifying, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other one is, I just wonder if you can also, you or whoever else on the team, break down the alarm calls because you know over the years, it's been pretty consistent uh, that our alarm call has been 3,000 average plus, and we've seen that in the last few years it's been rising. So I'm wondering, like, how much time is spent on an average alarm call? But also, if you have any indication of what is causing that increase, is it more buildings? Is it more businesses? Just wondering if you can give a little bit of idea of what you think is causing that increase when it comes to alarm calls, because it is take, seems like taking a significant amount of resources related to it. Um, so those are two questions I, I have, and, and that's it. Try not to go to 20 minutes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Lindell. Uh, Thank you, through the Mayor, to the Councillor. On the question about Fleet, uh, I've already sent uh, a request to Fleet to assess the European style truck that I mentioned earlier, along with the North American style truck particularly when it comes to electrification, because we're gonna have to make the pivot one way or the other, and quite frankly, I don't understand which one's the best solution. You know, the one might be better for maneuverability and turning radius and, you know, skinnier street uh, access, <clears throat> but it might be a problem for fleet to maintain uh, with totally different technology. So uh, I think, you know, in collaboration with our uh, partners not only in fleet but in the climate change group uh, that we trial two different trucks. So uh, I can't speak to your question specifically about whether direction from this group uh, would be helpful because I don't manage fleet, but I can certainly take back your comments and uh, and we are meeting with the climate change folks. Uh, it was originally scheduled two weeks ago and was postponed because of the weather. And I'm asking earnestly to trial both trucks because I don't know if we're gonna purchase what makes sense from an operational perspective, you know, with all the challenges that we've identified and I can't speak for fleet. So I think it makes sense to trial two different trucks. Um, as far as the false alarms, I'll let uh, Deputy Chief Andrews uh, kick it off, and then if there's anything to add, I'll add it. 
Sure, Your Worship, uh, through to the uh, Councillor. I think what we're seeing strategically, uh, the development within HRM is growing upward. And with these multi-occupancy uh, uh, types of buildings, they all come by building code with the requirement of alarm systems uh, to do so. We're also seeing trends of uh, security systems which offer enhancements such as CO2 detector and smoke detectors into home residential uh, alarm systems. Uh, and, and we're seeing a whole lot of growth uh, of both of those. Um, and I understand that uh, the alarm notification uh, fines, if you will, are helping some homeowners that have defective systems to motivate them to fix them, but we are just seeing more density of uh, multi-occupancy buildings, thus more alarms. Uh, and I understand that poses a whole lot of great challenges uh, in buildings such as uh, the nonprofit that converted a hotel, which had individual smoke detection within every unit, uh, to a new type of occupancy, such as uh, such as you know uh, a shelter or uh, or housing, uh, which uh, the normal workings of life, uh, showers and cooking and uh, smoking occasionally, uh, cause those alarms uh, to activate. So uh, it is a it is enhancing the overall safety. Uh, but it does pose uh, some alarms that, uh, that are not actually found to be fires or emergency situations. Right, and, and roughly how, how much, what's the average time you think is spent at an alarm call? If you factor in the time it takes to get there, at five minutes to get there, five minutes to come back from it, and 10 minutes on scene, we're tied up there about 20 minutes to a half hour for those kind of alarms. Right. And, and when those calls, a full a full truck is going with? Yeah, we would uh, put a three and one on that. So okay. there'd be a first due unit going code one, which is lights and sirens to get there as quickly as possible. And the balance of that alarm would be coming what we call code three. So driving normal road speed to get there. If uh, it's found by the first due unit that there is an alarm or multi uh, zones activated that might indicate that there is an emergency going on, those units would then upgrade to code one to get there as quickly as possible. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, your honorable Mike, no, Mike Savage. <laughs> I'm waiting for the transition from uh, your worship to uh, you know, your emer emeritus or something like that. Um, thank, uh, Chief, I'll just tell you a couple of things I wanted to, to, to mention more really than asking questions. Um, and this has occurred to me for a number of years that we need to have a conversation with provincial government about who has responsibility for health. Um, not that we would change the delivery of it, but we need to look at the payment of it. Um, uh, cities across the country have been uh, engaging in that conversation. The city of Calgary three or four years ago passed a motion to have a conversation about medical calls. Uh, Prince George BC, where I think FCM is in the next week or two weeks, uh, passed a motion to council recently to have a uh, conversation with the provincial government about the cost of medical uh, calls. And even more recently, cities like Saskatoon have been saying, look, we're doing more work that's not even in our bailiwick to begin with, like encampment, dealing with folks in encampments, needle exchange, overdose work that the fire department and police departments are very much involved in that really is um, provincial. So I think, I think it's going to be for the next council to do it. Um, but I have, I've, I've, Kathy and I have chatted already about um, we need to have that conversation. Um, more and more things that really aren't, you know, and I gotta, I gotta say, as, as, as Councillor Mason will know, we, we pushed for, for us to expand our mandate on things. Now we're kind of saying, well, not everything. Um, like there are some things the provincial government needs to pay for. We're fortunate to have the police and fire we do. Mayors for some time have been saying things like, we love uh, our fire and our police. We just don't know if we can afford them uh, anymore. And the fact is we can't afford not to have them. Uh, we need to have them. The budget of the fire department in 2016 was 58,300, and we're looking at a budget now of 92,000, which is a 58.6% increase, way beyond the growth of population and even uh, CPI. Uh, but the fact is that council has given direction that we want your service, we want that service to, you know, we've changed the standards specifically. We've added Sheet Harbor as a, as a career uh, department, we're adding uh, Middle uh, Muscadabit as a, as a fire department. So I think the council has been supportive, very supportive of um, police and, and fire. And if anybody needs to know why we've done it, uh, they would only have to go back to last uh, summer as one really specific example. And you know, for me to be, uh, to have seen what happened 
in Councillor Lovelace's area and other places. Um, you know what? That's, that's, that's why we invest in these things, and we're going to have to continue to. We're going to look at another motion today, I think, on that. So I, I have no concern. I shouldn't say that. I'm concerned about everything that we do, but I have no problem saying that we need to keep first-class firefighting in the municipality. Um, and these are tough budget times. You know, to go up by 60% in uh, seven or eight years uh, is a lot. Um, but we're not just investing in the fire department, uh, you know, Canada's oldest and most distinguished uh, regional fire and emergency department, but we're investing in the people that we want to keep safe. But I do think, I do think that we're going to have to have a conversation with provincial government who are seeing, it goes back to the fiscal framework. They have a lot of money coming in, which we don't have. Um, and as we're going to have to have that conversation uh, in the coming months and years, because uh, I think other provinces are going to have the same conversation. So unless you have a comment on that. Yeah, so the com thank you, Mr. Mayor, through, uh, through you to all of council. That's why we have listed in our project plans further conversations with EHS to align our services. It's a little bit of code to say, hey, we're a partner, we're a valued partner, and we need support to support your mission. And the same with the conversations with the port and DNRR. So uh, message heard, and we continue to move the ball down the field. Uh, but it takes time to build those relationships, and quite frankly, we had to demonstrate that we were worthy of that trust, and I think we've done that. In terms of message received, I, I align myself with Councillor Morris. And said, I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing that. We absolutely have to do that. But I do think we need to uh, have a look at, at, at whose responsibility this is and how do we fund this more equitably uh, going forward. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mike. No, I'm kidding. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just uh, I'll pick up on what has already been talked about a few times, then I'll move into something else. But uh, just, you know, several times we've heard, well, first let me thank you and your staff and all of the firefighters uh, who do such an amazing job. Uh, I think we take it for granted uh, sometimes uh, just how well protected we are and the bravery. I mean, uh, especially today when you're running into a fire and, you know, people's couches and chairs and carpets and, you know, basically they're giving you cancer every time you walk into a building or you think of all of the industrial parks that we have here and all the stuff that's probably unknown when you're walking into something. So that takes an amazing amount of, uh, of guts uh, to do that. So we all appreciate that. Um, there's been a bit of talk about sort of the roadways, uh, fire trucks and that kind of stuff. And several times people said North American or European. I just want to say that actually a lot of the smaller trucks are actually made here in North America. Um, I'm just looking on here and there's a great webinar from 2018 hosted by the Portland chief of uh, the fire department there on right sizing vehicles to their streets, Portland, Vancouver, Seattle, a bunch of cities, especially on the west coast have done this. Um, and so we should get away from that. North Americans do have smaller stuff. And in fact, I think you had mentioned your pumpers carry 500 gallons, is that what it was? So just looking here, uh, this is from the Volpe Center, U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, not sure what brand it is, but they actually show pictures of several different fire trucks. And the wheelbase is what makes the big difference. Uh, so here's a pumper at 1,500 gallons, a pumper at uh, five or 750 gallons, uh, 500 gallons, 500 gallons. And uh, one of them, that's a 500 gallon, uh, it has a curb to curb turn radius of 19 feet uh, compared to 36 feet for probably hours. Uh, so you can get half the, the turn uh, or, or double the turn, if you want to call it that, uh, carrying the same amount of water. So these are North American made. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll pivot from that. I'll turn from that, yes. <laughs> Around a curb uh, extension. Um, I was looking at the MBN Canada benchmarking data, and I'll put this plug in. I've said this in two different budget uh, debates for different departments over the last several years. I really think we should join MBN again. Uh, and um, it's, it's, it's difficult to go in when you're comparing apples and oranges, but if we're all part of it, we know it's an apples to apples comparison. What you've presented, and I know you have data because we talked about this, uh, but when I look at the MBN data, because it's not the same as what you had on your slides, they record their 90th percentile response in minutes and seconds. Whereas you had on your slides, you know, here's the percentage of time we're showing up within this 11 minutes or within this eight minutes. Um, and 
we seem to be doing okay in terms of we're getting better. When I look at some other cities, Hamilton, Sudbury, Winnipeg, uh, Calgary, um, uh, in the urban and the rural context, they're actually getting worse. If you look at, I don't have 2023 data, I have 2021 and 22 data here, but their response times are getting longer uh, and ours aren't. So I mean, that's a, a testament I think to you guys, but also council putting in the resources necessary to get us up to that level. Can you speak to like how we compare to other places, and you know, it's unfair for me to put you on the spot because we're not part of MBN, but just in general, because you've worked at senior positions in other uh, fire departments, how is it we're doing here compared to other places, and are we really making a dent? Because when I look at your slideshow, in the urban context, it seemed like we went up, and the ur in the rural context, we went up a fair bit. Um, so how are we doing? We still have a lot of work to do, but how are we doing compared to other places? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. <clears throat> As I had shared with you earlier, councillor, I'm a fan of MBN, and we were one of the last holdouts. Uh, I think we might have even had the slides in our deck last year, but based on the number of slides and the time it takes to get through those slides, <laughs> Um, we took those slides out this year. So we were holdouts. I believe in MBN. Um, in the comparison conversation, when we had the, the mayor at the Canadian Fire Chiefs Conference that was here in Halifax this year, I am the representative for the big city and metro chiefs for across Canada on the National Advisory Council for the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs. We met with, with the mayor. But prior to that meeting, I had had a you know, survey done by the membership of that group and asked them what their challenges were. And their challenges were uh, densification of the core and their ability to hit their response time metrics. One of the major differences between us and, uh, and other cities <coughs> is, uh, is densification. So the city plan, as you know, is trying to densify our core, but we don't have the same type of uh, geographical boundary. So let me use Winnipeg, for example. Winnipeg has a perimeter highway. It's a ring road, a, a highway that goes around the city. There's a little bit of exception to that. Some of the areas inside that ring road are not necessarily the city's responsibility, but for the most part, their growth is all within the city. So their stations are established. And what they're really needing to do is respond to densification in the core and maybe a little bit of sprawl on the outside, but not to the same type of challenges we have where we have sprawl leaving, you know, Hammond, you know, the West Bedford area and going down Hammond's Plains. Because if you think about throwing a pebble in a pond and the ripples that go out, the hardest place for us to get to is the outside of the ripple because everybody's passing a station who's already gone there, right? So we would like to build stations, which is why we're doing what we're doing this year, to be able to converge on calls. Our biggest challenge compared to everybody else outside of that is our ability to muster a second and third alarm because these high rises and the big box stores that we're putting in are not single family house dwelling. We should not be trying to get 14 firefighters on scene. We should be trying to get 28, 40 firefighters on scene. If you have what happened in the UK <clears throat> with that high rise fire, that would take every firefighter we have on duty uh, and all our volunteers it, within a re reasonable driving radius to be able to respond to that call. So NBN data would help us uh, but I'm already connecting with my colleagues because of my position to kind of understand their challenges versus ours. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. I'm out of time, so I may come back. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you so much, as said by my colleagues. Your team has worked through a lot of different issues, especially last year. and. I wanna thank you again for all of the work you do. The unprecedented fires and floods affected your team beyond their physical and mental capacity. So thank you. Um, experience firefighters and volunteers may have moved or left the province for whatever reason 
and maybe coming back, or some may want a change of pace. I'm wondering if sometimes you might want to throw the net a little further just to see if there's any interest out there. I'm not saying every time you advertise, but what do you think? Thank you, through the mayor to you, councillor. When we do a, well, first of all, we don't have many challenges with retention of our career sector. I think the, mm -hmm. the president just verified that. On occasion, you might lose one or two because they have a career opportunity, and that's a great thing if that happens, but for the most part, we don't have a challenge with attraction and retention. The volunteer uh, recruitment is a little bit more of a churn in that you know, we might have somebody for, you know, the days of having a volunteer firefighter for 20, 30 years seem to be across North America a challenge to have nowadays. It's more common to expect them for five to eight years, depending on what's going on in their life. So we're doing whatever we can to uh, recruit them faster, have them be committed to our mission. We also have volunteers who become career firefighters. But when we do recruitment for the career sector, people from across the country apply. So we don't limit it to people from Halifax by any means. Um, and there are provisions that the volunteers are given special, like our own volunteers are given special consideration in that process. But uh, it is, you know, a wide open recruitment and we cast the nets wide and far. Thank you, Chief. You led into one of my next questions, is how many career fighter, firefighters are currently on disability? Something long-term absence? Okay. Good afternoon, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, the council. Um, I don't have the precise figures and I want to recognize that the president of the IFF Local 268 is in the room. We will see a float uh, in our business unit of something like 20 persons uh, from the IFF who are either on long-term disability or on the job injury. We certainly recognize that we seem to be experiencing increases there, particularly related to occupational stress injuries. If you wish, I can get a precise number for you and, and bring it forward. The reason I, excuse me, the reason I ask is that affects the number of firefighters you actually have to send, send out on a fire. Okay, thank you. I also had a question, how many volunteers transfer to career firefighters, just roughly? Thank you, uh, through the mayor again to you, councillor. I think it was thir 33 transitioned in the last three years. It was on the speaking notes that I read earlier. Uh, I think it was 33 in the last three years. follow up on my question during last budget. Are you monitoring the participation of your volunteers? I know family and jobs and other situations can affect these numbers and availability, but have you ever monitored it, the attention, uh, sorry, the attendance of volunteers? Worship uh, through to the council. Yes, we absolutely do that. Uh, we have an expectation that our volunteers will be uh, available to respond after 5:30 each day and until 7 a.m. Uh, uh, the next morning. And that is as well as uh, uh, available to respond 24/7 on weekends and holidays in areas where there are not career staff. We do have participation rates, so we expect our volunteers to attend 20% of both the training that is offered as well as the uh, calls that are dispatched to their to their uh, station. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, do I have any time left, Mr. Mayor? Oh, no, but you can I'll come back. I will. Thank you. Uh, Chief, was, was there an update that we missed? It looked like Dave was trying to update something. Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, 
I thought he was correcting my number of volunteers. What he was saying was confirming the number of people who are on long-term or occupational injury as being 18 at this time. I think he had said around 20, it was 18. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just a couple of things. Um, you know, great conversation. Uh, I appreciate um, especially the conversation about medical uh, and seeing how many uh, medical calls and the increase in medical calls and obviously we've got an increasing and an aging population. So uh, looking at the memorandum of understanding that we're building with the province on homelessness, this would be a great opportunity to look at um, medical um, response. And I think, you know, when we talk about the investments in fire service, it's really important that we recognize the deficit that we've had um, because we grew so fast. And planning for the deficits that we're going to have as retirements uh, take place over the next little while. The um, intense development uh, that's taken place in uh, Hammonds Plains and is now taking place in Lucasville primarily uh, stems from land use bylaw, right? Uh, that the municipality had in place regarding the quote unquote seniors housing. Uh, that was a loophole which we've closed, but that being said, we've got about 3,000 plus units coming in a very short time. So with that, Mr. Mayor, I'm gonna put a motion on the floor and I think Katie uh, can put it up on the screen that the budget committee direct the chief administrative officer to prepare a briefing note for the balance adjustment list that provides costing and operational implications to expedite the conversion of a fire station in Hammonds Plains or Upper Tantallon, so station 50 or 65, from E platoon composite staffing to 24 seven career composite staffing, along with a dedicated fall 2024 cadet training. Thank you, Councillor Oathit. Seconded by Councillor Oathit. Now, um, it says dedicated fall 2024 cadet training. It actually starts in August um, and, uh, and continues through. And certainly, Chief, you can speak to that. Uh, but I do think that it's well beyond time that this community, which continues to exist in an extreme wildfire uh, uh, area, as well as the fact that we're still, uh, we still have deficits with regards to egress. Um, and in hearing the concerns uh, around the table uh, and as also knowing that we've got some work taking place to review traffic calming, um, to review and uh, implement hydrants and address the lack of uh, piped water and piped um, resources for firefighters in some of these areas. And I'm talking about subdivisions that you know, you're going 10, 12, 15 kilometers back from a main road uh, where there are, you know, there's no hydrants. So um, thank you, Councillor Outhead. I look forward to the conversation on this and I ask you for your support. Thank you. Okay, the motion is on the floor. Is there discussion on the motion? Okay, so that motion has carried. Uh, that'll come back to us for consideration. Yes. Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Chief, I want to uh, go back to where I started off my earlier question about mental health. You know, you stated that when it comes to mental health, uh, we don't have best practice. and. Um, 
uh, Deputy Chief Melbourne said, it's not a perfect network and there are gaps, but we're good. We're, we have a lot of good stuff going on. And so um, no question here now, but as I think my colleagues now know on Tuesday, I've got a motion coming to the council to see if we can fill in some of those gaps and so we can have some more conversations. So thank you for that. You know, we have to be very careful uh, that we don't get, it's a fine line getting too deep into operations because we're not experts in effective firefighting, yet we have the opportunity to make comments and have impact, and our decisions can be either negative or, or positive. Unlike the police department, in the police department we have, we can give opinions, but we have no authority to change things and how they operate. We can approve the budget or not approve the budget, but it's a little bit different here, right? So I'm saying that because I do have questions uh, about specifically possible duplication of services. When we talked to the police department, even on Wednesday we spoke to Bill Moore and public safety, we were looking at are, are there duplications when it comes to policing and public safety? If we have similar question about fire service, and I look at uh, what the fire service does and now what our uh, GSAR service, a ground search and rescue does. And so for example, in your budget you've identified uh, acquiring training and equipment to bring us up to a level of that swift water. Uh, the Halifax Search and Rescue have that, and I believe in, in Councilor, uh, the, the Deputy Mayor's area, their Search and Rescue now are adding that kind of a, uh, training and, and uh, equipment also. So when I look at it, not being an expert in any of this, saying, okay, is this a duplication uh, of service? Uh, do we really need it? Uh, do, do we need the fire service to get up to, uh, up to this level? Obviously, a gap was identified when we had the floods, right? I think that was probably an indicator. A flag went up and said, wait a minute, we may not be able to respond the way we did, though Halifax Search and Rescue did have that expertise. So uh, can you just speak, speak to that, uh, why that's, uh, that's in your budget, what are you looking to accomplish? And I'm not trying to put you chief for the fire service here and ground search and rescue here. And uh, you know, I, I, we were very fortunate, I think Bill Moore said on Wednesday, we really have four emergency services. We have fire, we have police, we have EHS, and we really have ground search and rescue. But so uh, ground search and rescue has really proven their worth over the last number of years, particularly this past year for a whole number of reasons. So can you just talk about what that motion is or under Swift Water Rescue, the training, the equipment, the 175 cage you're asking for, and how does that relate to ground search and rescue and their capabilities and their abilities, sir? Through the mayor to you, Councillor, I'll try to answer this question and stay respectful as I go through it yeah, uh, with our colleagues in GSAR. Certainly no offense to anything that they may do in their mission, but I think council has given us a clear mission. Our mission is water rescue. It doesn't define the types of water rescue, save and accept we don't do uh, salt water rescue. Right. So uh, quite honestly, uh, I was surprised when we didn't do swift water rescue uh, after the floods, but as, uh, as we've been going through accreditation, as mentioned earlier, all of our programs, particularly our specialty programs, hazmat, high rise, tech rescue, water rescue, confined space rescue, uh, are doing a thorough review of their programs and identifying gaps in what we can do and what we should do based on council's direction in our administrative order and the uh, industry best practice. And then we have to have a plan in place to address that. So uh, we are called to all water, water rescue calls and there are gaps in our system. So yes, we identified SWIFT for water rescue, but the reality is that the, a lot of money that you see, the allotment of money that you see there is more than swift water rescue. It's to imp, you know, replace a bunch of aging equipment for water rescue across our whole uh, system. So you've probably seen us out doing ice rescue training, for example. The reality is a lot of the skills are similar for ice rescue as surface-based rescue. Uh, swift water rescue is a skill a little bit unique, but we are first responders and we are there first. So the flood that happened, although it uh, created all kinds of infrastructure and damage to homes, 
There goes our team right there. Uh, although, thanks for the support, folks. <laughs> you, you set that up in your chief, yeah. Those yeah. federal horns. <laughs> right. So, you know, what happened in that flood was an area of fast moving water and we wanted to remove people from the other side of the fast moving water. The people were not in imminent danger, which meant we could allow time after we realized we didn't have the ability to do that, to work with our GSAR partners and bring their, uh, bring their skills and equipment to the table. But the reality is we're there first and if there was somebody in harm's way, it is swift water rescue. If you don't pull them out of the water and they're in the water, they won't be there very long. So this is addressing a fundamental gap in council's direction to do water rescue and to do it safely. I know if we send our firefighters to a water rescue call and they're not equipped to deal with it, they're going in anyways, which is exactly what happened in Montreal when the firefighter was killed there. So we have done this review across our system and we need to fix this gap because we do respond to that call when 911 calls in. And GSAR will have to speak to what they do and what they don't do. So I'll have to come back to it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to make a, a, a motion for an information report. Um, I, I'll just go ahead and put it on the floor here that I move that the budget committee direct the CAO to provide an information report on the staff hours, resources, and financial implications associated with Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency responding to medical assistance calls including types of calls being responded to and impact on effective firefighting force response times. Second. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about this around the table and as, uh, as the mayor was uh, just saying earlier, municipalities and other places are looking at formalizing these agreements and recognizing that there is a cost implication um, to municipalities for filling in these gaps. Again, you know, we keep seeing services being informally downloaded to municipalities without any proper financial compensation or recognition, um, even though it's not our jurisdictional authority. Um, so, so um, you know, I think we do have a critical role in responding to medical calls. Um, I'm not suggesting that that's something that we stop doing, but it's rather we, we look at what that relationship is. And it makes perfect sense that, you know, if we have the capacity to help in those medical calls, then, then that's great. That's like efficiently and effectively using taxpayer money kind of ac across the levels of government. But without formal recognition of that, the concern is that we keep filling in, we keep filling in the gaps and charging that service to property taxpayers when they're already paying for it, to paying for that service to another level of government. So, you know, I think there is a, a financial responsibility to, to really look at this, particularly when you see it's the number one thing that you respond to, almost 5,000 calls this past year. Um, so I um, hope I have the support of the rest of my council colleagues for this, for this information report, um, particularly on the financial implications. Thank you. Just to be clear, that's not for the bell, that's for further dis discussion and... Yeah, like There's no number for the bell, but uh, yeah, yeah, the information report. Yeah. I think we have to start somewhere and, and there's obviously financial implications. Yeah, so we I, need to I start by understanding that. It would certainly take some time. Okay, uh, Councillor Outhead on this. Uh, just very quickly, I just want to emphasize about what I think I heard from the council, and I strongly support this, is that we're not saying we shouldn't be doing this. We're not saying get us out of the business of doing this. We're just saying what does this cost us? So then if we have no idea what a cost is, then maybe we can look at how to to look for other sources to cover those costs. I don't want the media or folks or, or the members to think that we're not suggesting for a moment that we shouldn't be doing this. So just for clarification. I think that's 100% correct. Councillor Stoddard. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of questions. False alarms, I know they affect your team. Yeah. Oh, yeah. stop, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was going, what I was going to. Um, yeah. Just uh, so that you're on the main motion, Councillor Stoddard? You're on the main motion. No, not on sorry. Yes, yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, just, uh, uh, John is, is, since this is a regional, a regional council issue, it might, this could come back to regional council, could it not? Well, budget committee. Yeah, I think I think councillor understands that. I think she's indicated she's not expecting this for the bow. But so the, we can still do this, and they can come back to council, right? Direction. Yeah. Direction. Yeah, for this to come back to council. Okay. Councillor Smith. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So you, that's the point. I so support this overall, just in terms of process. So should we be passing or? not passing, depending, I can, you know, I'm not gonna assume what council's gonna do, but should we be passing the main motion on the floor and then this come forward, or can we do this now? Because this isn't a budget item, and it, and it could, if we add to go, to go to regional council, maybe, but it's not really an item for budget, so I'm just wanting the process here. Should we pass the main motion and then this come forward afterwards? Well, either way, we're in budget discussions today. So I think, in my view, we just, if we pass this, it comes back to council as if it was passed at council. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Katie, is that okay with you? Katie said it's okay. I trust her. If there's a problem here, then go to the clerk. Uh, um, colleagues, uh, we have a clerk here. Um, are we ready for the question on the motion? Okay, so that'll be carried. We'll go back to the main motion. Councillor Stoddard. So I'm going back to my main motion and uh, I'm just wondering um, when a, someone is injured and goes to the hospital, do your members have to remain with, with the patient or? Uh, resident until it's passed over to a medical person because um, I know HRP does that and it takes up some time. Just wondered if you have to do that as well, please. Through the mayor to you, Councillor, the answer is sometimes. So depending on the severity of the injury, let's say, for example, we're doing CPR, we would typically respond in with the ambulance crew to assist with the resuscitation, uh, but we would not be caught in those situations in an offload delay because the patient's critical, they go right back into the resuscitation room and we're typically freed up from those calls uh, quickly. The other time that we might be required to carry on is if uh, our firefighter, who happens to be a paramedic, actually has a higher scope of practice than the paramedic who arrives on the ambulance, then they have to maintain that care until they get to the hospital and transfer the, uh, the patient to the hospital staff. Thank you, you're also saying that 26 of your inspect, 26 percent of your inspections. Um, I'm wondering if you have any breakdown between commercial and residential. Do we have that? I think we do, but it'll take a few moments to get it. Thank you very much. Okay, while that's happening, we'll go to Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Chief, I just, oh, sorry, he's, he's looking for his notes there. Hold on to my time there, uh, Katie. Mr. Mayor, I can forward that to the Councillor afterwards. It was in a slide we took out, so I will uh, send that to you shortly. So it's Lori's fault. How the mighty have fallen. 
Uh, uh, Councillor Mancini, you have a minute left. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Chief, I wanted to go back to our conversation about uh, 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 swift water uh, training and equipment and so on. You did allude to that you're doing a review of things such as hazmat and swift water, and there's, there's a list of items, is that correct? That you're doing. In that, is there a review of also how you do, and so going back to this, this conversation about what does GSAR do and what do you do about search and rescue? Is that part of that review? It's not. So is that something that we can request to be part of that review? And what I'm getting to is you'll get a call uh, that someone's lost in uh, one of our trails. You guys are first responders, so you're first on the, sign, uh, on the scene. And do you go in and you start searching? Is that Correct? I'm looking puzzled at me. I'll ask Deputy Chief Andrews to come up to give me a hand on this question. Certainly we have conversations on a regular basis with our police colleagues and uh, our GSAR, GSAR colleagues on how we respond to calls together. So typically, if you're talking about, you know, somebody who breaks a leg on a trail or on something, trail or something like that, the yeah. call comes in usually as a medical call. And mm -hmm. if they are easily, you know, their location is easily identified, uh, our crews may very well access the crew quickly. But if they are uh, hurt farther into the woods and there's no known location, Obviously, GSAR are the experts in that, and they would be mobilized by typically the police in that situation, and uh, work alongside our crews to work out, you know, who's bringing the person out, them or us. Yeah, and she that answers my question. Uh, you know, I think that there's a bigger issue here that's not necessarily a direct budget issue that I'll bring back to regional council. I think how we dispatch is what we need to review. Right now, so you dispatch, if I call 911 and it's a policing issue, someone's robbing my house, police are consent, my house is on fire, fire gets set, medical, fire, EHS. It's how does GSAR get activated? And they get activated through police. I really think, and I may be missing things, I'm not an expert in this again, but if you're calling 911 and it's a search and rescue scenario, why doesn't, the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, should they not be dispatching uh, search and rescue? So I'm not asking for an answer here now, Chief. I think I'll come back at a later time to the Regional Council to have a, 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 an appropriate motion to look into this and see if there's a better way of doing this, right? So thank you. Uh, I do have time left. So other questions for you, Chief. Uh, two more questions. Uh, the delay in the building code update. What impact has that had from your perspective? And my other question is, you alluded to earlier working uh, with the harbor and such, but electric vehicles now and more and more uh, part of our community. Hydrogen is gonna be part of our community, definitely with a port, uh, that's, gonna, that's something that's coming to the table. So if you could, you know, how are you preparing for the response to incidents with those types of uh, technology and vehicles? So building code and EV and hydrogen. The last two questions. In what you meant by building code, sorry, I so missed there's, the beginning. So we were expecting a change to the building code, and that's been delayed now. And so in that building code, we thought there were gonna be things related to environmental perspective, but I also thought there was gonna be changes to the fire suppression and things that would help, uh, because that's what we all live by, planning lives by, you guys living by. So uh, uh, my understanding that was gonna be in the, the latest updates, but now they're telling us that uh, change is being delayed and is there a, a concern from you uh, on that? And if you don't know that answer now, Chief, we can take that offline, that's fine. Yeah, by way of uh, this comment, I'll ask Chief Beals to work with Chief Covey to get you information later that's on fine. the building codes. I know the building code updates continue to be a frustration for the fire service right across the country, getting it in the national building code and fire code and then down to the provinces. So we will get that information to you uh, later. That's fine. The other question you'd asked about was kind of green energy for lack of a better word. Right. So our hazmat team is currently assessing our capabilities in uh, with our hazmat response and our regular initial response in being able to address those calls. We are plugged in, uh, actually, uh, when I was the president of the International Association of Fire Chiefs, I actually stood up a task force to deal with this issue in certainly North America and across the globe because 
the fire codes are so far behind Is the technology, we didn't understand what we didn't even know. So uh, there is a task force that's working on this for the fire service in North America, and we are plugged into that work. And we have our own, for lack of a better word, mini task force that's working on this. And the leaders for that are our, our hazmat teams. And they are, you know, going to conferences, bringing uh, people in to teach us about what we don't know. And we are trying to work with partners that are going to be big players in this, like the port, uh, to make sure we understand our uh, need to be able to respond to those risks. Uh, that also includes energy storage solutions for Nova Scotia power. Uh, may I, uh, Mr. Mayor, and nobody else? No. Uh, to mark? Committee of the whole, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for that, Chief. I appreciate that. Um, our fire station, so great discussion every budget meeting at the capital time. You're moving ahead with your new headquarters. Uh, uh, we, you know, you and I have had conversations about new fire stations. I know that Councillor Outhead is also in Councillor Lovelace. Um, our existing fire stations, can you explain to me are, uh, how are they inspected? Are they inspected like any other building in HRM for, from a fire perspective, for fire safety? Also about the state of the buildings, because I, to be frank, Chief, I, I speak to your firefighters all the time. When I see them, they, I don't, they don't know me, I introduce myself and I ask them how they're doing, we have conversations. Some of them share and some of them don't. No, a number of them have expressed concerns about the state of some of our older fire stations. And in their words, and I, and I don't know, uh, they're saying, you know, there are some fire stations that are in great need of repair and maintenance, if not replacement, as you and I have discussed. So could you explain how that works, how we identify it? Uh, I know we had Philip up earlier talking about when you engage them and looking at capital. So could you just talk about how that works? I'll ask my colleague to come back from <laughs> buildings to speak to the issue of the aging infrastructure and and uh, the challenges on that front. But I would say uh, I've personally been in every single fire sure. station many, many times and would say I am in concurrence that some of our buildings are uh, well beyond their useful life in some situations. Just simple math, right? We have over 50 stations. If you said the life of a station is 50 years, you would think we'd be replacing a station every single year. Uh, in the time I've been here, we've built one station and we're excited to build uh, another one, which will take a year and a half. So in the course of eight, nine years, that's two stations. So that's projecting a life expectancy of 250 years, just simple math. Uh, and we certainly have challenges with doors that break and you know roofs that start to leak on top of that. But I certainly will pass the talking stick over to Philip about how they try to manage that challenge uh, in amongst the rest of the capital budget pressures. Good afternoon, Philip Ganzik, Director of Facility Design and Construction. <coughs> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. <coughs> Excuse me. When we are developing the capital program um, that we uh, build every, and you, uh, you uh, Council approves annually, <coughs> I meet regularly with my counterpart in uh, Deputy Chief Beals in fire, and he gathers up his stakeholder information with respect to the state of good repair for his facility. So we have two types of projects that would typically tackle for fire or any of the other business units. It would be state of good repair for existing facilities, or it would be a recapitalization, like a major renovation or and or replacement. <clears throat> so Chief mentioned that we are soon to undertake the construction of headquarters and fire station. That's a new uh, build, that's a new project, but we have many, many every year uh, state of good repair and functional improvements to fire stations across the service. Okay, thanks, Philip. Uh, my last, um, just a comment that I'm finished, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I support Councillor Mason's motion about we need to be speaking to you know, uh, to you on a more frequent basis. And I think executive yeah. is the place to do it because a lot of questions that I've asked and others have asked are indirectly related to the budget, but really they're talking about fire service. And so we need to make that happen uh, sooner than later and so that we can have these kinds of conversations. Thank you, sir, for uh, the work. I appreciate your time today. Mr. Mayor. I Thank you. Uh, Council uh, Chief. Mr. Mayor, I have the information for Councillor Stoddart's question. 
So if I recall your question, Councillor, it was how many closed cases, which means buildings that have been inspected and signed off as good uh, in the various building classifications, for lack of a better word. Uh, we have 278 residential buildings, they're typically multi-unit residential buildings, and 656 commercial buildings. So commercial buildings includes all kinds of different classifications. There's assembly, daycare, uh, mercantile, industrial, and there's three different types of industrial. So uh, many in that 656. And I have the specifics of each of those classifications if you want to see them. And we, do a, we try where possible to do a risk-based inspection. Because we can't do 100% of our buildings, we just don't have the bandwidth to do it, we do what we feel is the highest priority. And typically, those are institutions, uh, not the ones the fire marshal does, but you know daycares and stuff like that. We focus on high risk, and then when we get them done, move off to the lower risk ones. But we also have a legislated responsibility to do an inspection by request or complaint and they have to be inspected whether we think they're a high priority or not. Thank you. Councillor Hensby. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Hi, Chief. First of all, um, as everybody else said, thanks for the great service that the fire service has done this past year. It has been, a, a, been an incredible year for, for the fire, from, from fire to floods and everything in between, and motor vehicle accidents and the like. Um, my question in regards to the um, East Shore Lifestyle Center and how our design's coming along and do you think we have enough land or footprint there to do what we need to do in regards to having a, a nice facility in conjunction with the Lifestyle Center with the storage and capacity and all that other stuff and just kind of wonder if the foot, I don't want to get negotiating real estate publicly but I think we may have to look at the footprint of the property down there. Mr. Deganzik. Good afternoon. Philip Deganzik, Director of Facility Design. Reception to you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. With respect to Eastern Shore Lifestyle Center and Fire Station, the design work has been undertaken and awarded, and we are looking at having a site approval completed for April. Uh, that is used based on the existing footprint that we have today to work with. I have no other information that I can share on that one. So understanding that our firm is Architecture 49, is a company that's been awarded the tender. Uh, do you have, I assume that you and the library and our recreation department already have internal discussions in regards to uh, footprint and fitting pieces together, but when do we anticipate having some public engagement in the community? I, to be honest with you, I'm not certain what, when the schedule for the next uh, public engagement is. What I can tell you is that we are hoping to have an approved master site plan in April. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing no other names on the board, we will vote on the motion uh, as amended on a couple of occasions. Everybody ready to vote? That carries. Chief, thank you to you, to your deputies, to the administration, and uh, everybody else for being here, and uh, uh, all of council um, appreciates the work of you and your team, and Brendan, of you and the firefighters as well, um, and the important work that they do. Okay, we have another item to go today. Should we take five minutes, Jerry, and get ready for that? Uh, so just take five minutes, folks. Uh, don't run off to the hot tub or anything. Let's come right back at 10 past two.
Folks, I just, I've just been told that um, Dave and Tyler have a 95 minute presentation, so the sooner we get started, the sooner we're gonna be done uh, and uh, out of here before Easter. So I'm just, if you, if you know any, if you have any friends on council that you could convince to come back, please do so. Okay, uh, all right, we are back uh, now with fiscal services. We have um, Captain John Cabotrail, Dave Harley, and we have Tyler uh, Higgins with us. Uh, folks, I'll hand the floor to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dave Harley, Director of Accounting and Financial Reporting, and I am joined here by Tyler Higgins, our Manager of Budget and Reserves. Uh, we are here to present the 24-25 uh, Fiscal Services Budget. Uh, we've also been joined uh, by several members of finance uh, behind us here who are uh, also here to help answer uh, any questions you may have. So uh, with that said, I'm gonna pass it off to Tyler and he's gonna uh, run you through the presentation. Thank you, Dave, and uh, through the Mayor to Council. Uh, I will be quick on this, I promise. Uh, so the fiscal services budget, uh, just to very quickly go through it, what is fiscal services? Uh, very easily put, fiscal services are all the pieces of this organization that don't really fit in one business unit, but really benefit the entire organization. It also has items that we're obligated to do or collect uh, funds on behalf. So the big thing in fiscal services is obviously property taxes. Uh, the other big items would be your, it has all of our debt charges. It has capital from operating in it. It also has a significant amount of funding to reserves. And the principal mandatory costs are all funded within fiscal through area rates. And this year in fiscal, we'll have the election cost. So I'll get right to the dollars and cents, our meat and potatoes as Bill Moore says. Uh, so <clears throat> next year, the fiscal services budget is expected to change by $70 million. The big piece of that is obviously it carries the tax increase. So where the budget's balanced at 8.9%, it has that entire lift in the budget right now. To go line by line through what's here, uh, we do have a service enhancement in fiscal and that's the, the redesigned nonprofit program. You'll see nonprofit on here twice, that's not an error, we just split it between the service enhancement and the existing program. On the inflationary side in fiscal, we do have an increase in all of our debt costs of $8.7 million. And I just mentioned nonprofit. I am going to come back. There's a separate slide on nonprofit. On the contractual side, we have an increase in both bank fees and insurance costs next year. And the revenue changes, as I mentioned about the tax increase, but we also have a decrease in our deed transfer tax next year. And we have a slide later on in the presentation about that as well. We're also expecting an increase in our uh, interest revenue, and that's just mainly a catch up. Uh, the interest rates have stayed higher than longer than we expected, so the budget's going to be catching up next year on that. And the last pieces to talk about are the transfers. So this first item, uh, the reduction in cap from op, uh, if you recall from other business units, you would have heard them say positions transferred from capital. So they will have increases in their budget, PW and IT being them. Fiscal will have the reduction of that. So it's just a move out of fiscal because it's funding the capital plan over to the operating budget of the respecting bu respective business units. Next uh, is the RCMP increase from last year. So we're, we had the contract that just moved over from fiscal to uh, the RCMP business unit. We changed our compensation provision by $6.7 million. And we reduced our funding to the SI reserve. That was tied into deed transfer tax. So where deed transfer tax has decreased, we decreased the funding to that SI reserve. And the final two smaller items is uh, corporate memberships transferred over from finance into fiscal. And the last piece is just some uh, minor changes. We have one reserve that's tied to inflation that we have to change every year. <clears throat> okay, the mandatory taxes. So these are the, uh, the big four. Uh, we have area rates for each one of these. We're not accountable to how they're spent. We effectively just collect the money and send it to the province. Uh, next year, the largest increase is in, is in housing on a percentage basis at 14.8% and then the largest dollar increase is in mandatory education at 20 million or 11.1% next year. Uh, PVSC and correctional services will increase by just under 1% each. So <clears throat> how do the mandatories kind of tie into the overall tax bill? When we're talking about our budget, we're always talking about the municipal portion of the bill. So that's the 8.9% that we've been uh, talking about lately, what the budget's balanced on. 
the mandatories next year, so they're a separate piece on the bill. They're outside of that. They don't affect our overall budget, but they do have their own line on, on the bill. So next year, we're expecting the mandatory piece on the bill to go up by 7.4%. Now, that includes all the items I just spoke about on the previous slide, plus supplementary, supplementary education, fire protection, and the right-of-way charge. So when you take our portion of the bill at 8.9% and the mandatories of 7.4%, we're expected, expecting the total average residential tax bill to increase by 8.4% in the upcoming year. <clears throat> so to talk on the nonprofit piece, as I mentioned earlier, uh, overall the nonprofit program is seeing an increase next year of 1.1 million. 600,000 of that is relating to the redesign program. And that's just, um, there'll be a report coming to Grants Committee uh, this month, as it is March now, uh, outlining how that's uh, going to be changing, how funds are going to be reallocated within the program. The remaining increase in that program is all tied to existing participants in the program. So most of those participants are not under the cap. So they've seen their assessments increase by over 12% the last few years. And then the final piece is there are some new additions next year for about $200,000. And new to fiscal this year is there will be an FTE in fiscal that's just tied to the election and that transferred over from legal services. So next year you're going to see this FTE uh, again, but the opposite way will be coming out of fiscal once the election's finished. D-transfer tax, so uh, I, we would have uh, probably given this slide before at uh, budget direction. Uh, we have updated it for the latest projection on D-transfer tax. Uh, it's, we're seeing D-transfer tax, it is a decrease in the upcoming budget, but we're expecting it to moderate in future budgets. Uh, next year, probably be about 64, 65 million, so we're expecting that's gonna be the new level for D-transfer tax going out, and we did get an uh, econometric forecast on this, so. We're hoping that holds true, but always caution with DE transfer tax forecasts is it is a market-driven revenue. Uh, one sale could change this one way or the other. And debts. So next year, uh, well, this past year, we had the second highest debt issuance in HRM's history at uh, $80 million. That issuance uh, was at an effective interest rate of 5.29% which is the highest, issu or highest issuance rate in the past 10 years. Now, a bit of good news on that is we're hoping in the upcoming years, interest rates are gonna start to moderate so we won't be saddled with as much debt costs in the future years, or interest costs, excuse me, where the capital program is backstopped by debt, we'll probably see an increase in debt in the future, but interest rates should moderate to help the burden of that. And this is the last one uh, to talk about reserves. This is still a work in progress as reserves will change as the year closes. Uh, we will be providing a detailed budget on reserves when we get to the budget book. So you'll see each individual reserve, the commitments, the per, uh, what we'll be funding it by and what will be coming out of it. But for the upcoming budget right now, we're expecting that all of our reserve balances will increase. And that's mainly because we're gonna start rebuilding the uh, risk reserve. On the obligation reserve side, we're seeing some land sales coming through the uh, business park reserve. And the final is the opportunity to reserve that's still being built up for all the SI projects. And with that, I'll conclude it with a view of the Salt Marsh Trail looking toward Lawrencetown. And any questions, uh, please let me know. <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Uh, Councillor Outhit. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Would you like the motion put on there? Okay, I'm happy to move that the uh, Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate incorporate the uh, fiscal services proposed 2025 uh, budget and business plan in the accompanying plan and supporting presentation uh, attached to the staff report dated March 1st, 2024 into the draft 2024-25 operating budget. So moved. Um, thank you, and thanks uh, from the presentation from the dynamic duo here. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, this is probably more of a question for the CAO or the CFO, because you talk about the mandatory um, things, that the money that we collect for the province, and we don't say how it's spent, but we collect it, and of course when people open it, they look at the bottom line and see that amount on their bill and don't realize that roughly 30% goes to the province. But there are some changes coming on what is deducted, how much, and by who, and whatnot. What can, are we comfortable 
talking about today and the impact that that's going to have on the bill when somebody opens it. Um, I think the fact that the CAO came down indicates that she might answer you that want, one. want to speak to this. I, I don't think I'm spilling beans or anything because the budget is now public. But yeah. uh, Mr. Chair, through to the councillor, the provincial budget has been tabled. However, uh, we will not get our definitive answer on service exchange until around the end of next week. Okay. So when we come back uh, to talk about budget after that, then we'll be able to tell you what the bill impact would be. Okay, I will accept that answer. Thank you. Thank you. No other, oh sorry, Councillor Hensby. One, do we anticipate any grant lieu of tax information for either for provincial or federal uh, PIFs payments? We haven't heard from you all day, have we? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Mr. Blackwood, CFO. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So with, with respect to PIL payments, do you mean like um, just when we receive the payments? I assume they're set annually as well, or are they, or, or they forecast in a multiple year agreement? So I'm curious, and, uh, do we know what our PILF payments are gonna be this year and when do we expect them? Uh, yes, yeah, we would, we would have those uh, in the budget. Uh, so we budget our uh, PILF, uh, federal, provincial PILF uh, every year, like we do our tax revenue as well as our uh, individual tax agreements. And do any of those pills have uh, inflationary factors added to them to index them to inflation, or are they just stuck numbers? Uh, well, our PILT uh, for federal and provincial uh, and Crown Corps would be based on assessment. So they would be uh, uh, taxed under the PILT Act. Uh, some properties, for example, like Citadel and Halifax Port Authority would have deductions from assessment based on in ineligible assessment. And then uh, on our tax agreements, there's different economic uh, proxies involved there. So for example, the airport would have passenger counts, uh, Irving Shipyard would be FTEs, um, et cetera. And, uh... and some have CPI uh, pieces as well. So for example, uh, Halifax Airport Agreement uh, would have a inflationary factor with respect to the base amount uh, of that tax agreement. And are there any outstanding appeals on any PIF uh, <coughs> amounts? Uh, no, no, we settled uh, the um, appeals on the Citadel back in 2016. Um, we got a $20 million settlement on that and we uh, negotiated um, on the Halifax Port Authority, all our um, outstanding built issues there. I think we ended up with about a million dollar surplus on that. So we haven't had any real built issues for over the last five, six years. We clear, cleared them up uh, at that time. And is the airport tax agreement coming up due soon? Uh, per direction from council, um, we are going to enter into good faith negotiations with the airport uh, this year. And um, the HIAA, as, as we said earlier, um, has agreed that uh, it's only fair in their behalf that they pay the uh, climate action tax. So that's about an additional $200,000. And there'll be a report coming forward probably in the next month, uh, just with the amendment to the agreement that we can uh, bill that amount. And the amount we have for assessments, well, what, what we collect on taxes and stuff, is how is that assessed to us? Is it based on our total assessment base or the amount of accounts that we have with the Property Valuation Services Corporation? Like, how are we built, how is that determined, that calculation? Uh, for PVSC, I think it's just, it's based on the cost to operate uh, operate the corporation. And it's been very reasonable. I don't think they've ever had uh, um, like any more than a 1% increase uh, year over year. I know they they are an organization that sort of prides themselves, uh, you know, on keeping, keeping lean. But is that prorated to us based on our assessment base or based on our amount of accounts? Yeah, yeah, okay, I get your question. Yeah, it's it's prorated to us based on, uh, I think it's uh, based on our size or, or the number of accounts. So being the biggest municipality, we pay a greater share. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Lovely. Thank you. Um, I did have a question that I didn't, but now I do again. Here's the thing. Uh, with the provincial tax on the property bill, so we're not really sure uh, how much is going to come off of that, when it's going to come off, but we'll find out soon enough. However, with the provincial budget being tabled, uh, my question now is around the other implications of this provincial budget and the download of provincial res responsibility to the municipality, primarily the Coastal Protection Act being thrown out the window. Is, uh, is budget committee gonna receive a briefing note on the implications, potential implications to the property tax bill for this coming fiscal year based on the provincial budget download to the municipality? CAO. We circulated uh, two briefing notes at the end of the day yesterday, very late at the end of the day yesterday. One was a briefing note on the implications of the Coastal Protection Act. The second one was a briefing note on the provincial budget. Um, with respect to what we see in the provincial budget, there are not incremental costs that are visible to us at this point in time. Visible. And with respect to the Coastal Protection Act, our assessment is that um, there's probably little effect on HRM compared to other municipalities because yeah. this municipality has already been very progressive through Halifax and also through land use planning in terms of thinking about coastal protection mm -hmm. when it comes okay. to planning. Thank you so much for that, that's helpful. I, I've got 300 plus emails I haven't get, gotten through. But uh, will that information, those briefing notes be made public? Yes, there's okay. nothing in those briefing notes that can't be made public. Good. I think the logistics of that would be we will talk to the clerk's office and just convert them to an information report. Wonderful, thank you so much, Madam CAO. Thank you, thank you. Councillor Mason. Thanks. Uh, more of a comment than a question. So knowing that there's a chance corrections and housing will come out before the budget is done, I, I would just ask finance to reconsider how we present the provincial mandatory contributions breakdown in the pie chart because the supplementary education, totally us. Right of way, totally us. Fire protection, we're gonna have to do that one way or the other. Uh, and property valuation services corporation, like we are bound to do that, but like we would have to, you know, we could go back to the old way where we had our own department, we would be paying for it. Like, I feel like it's a little misleading to have that top level number, say the 195 million or whatever, when it's going to come down to that mandatory education, which is currently 81%. That's all that's going to be left that is really absolutely nothing to do with us that we pay. So, so I think we should break that out because saying these are mandatory contribution breakdowns, at least two of those are discretionary and the other ones are things we'd have to do anyway. So that are municipal functions rather than provincial stuff that we're paying for. So I think that we should have a look at that. It will help us. This isn't really a fiscal thing, but it'll help us politically as we continue to try and get the mandatory education tax uh, reviewed. Thank you. Thank you. That's, I should be looking. And that's assuming that we get the news that we want to get uh, at yeah, the end of next week. Well, it's all three of them. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you for your presentation. Um, I thought earlier I had asked our CFO what the connection or um, credit to HRM had with the summary offense tickets, and, but I see them on here again. Is it a negative to us or a plus? Jerry or Dave? David? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. So the summary offense tickets, that's a revenue stream that we have coming into us uh, as uh, part of our uh, collection of those uh, fines and debt as paid through the summary offense ticket process. So uh, that's a revenue uh, that you'll see coming in there. That's why it's showing in that way. Um, and we, we are seeing some changes to it uh, year over year, but that is why you're seeing it uh, shown in that perspective. So SOTs are basically parking tickets and um, things like that. Okay, yeah, so we do get revenue from that. I was under the impression we didn't. <laughs> yes, yeah, so summary offense tickets, uh, they would be uh, tick, uh, fines that would be prosecuted in, in provincial court. So we break out parking tickets separately. Um, 
and then you know summary offense tickets is every, anything for stuff prosecuted under liquor control act to billing code etc so we would get revenue only on the ticket portion we get we get revenue on all summary offense tickets okay thank you for the clarification you're welcome thank you ready for the question That motion is carried. Thank you, uh, folks. That uh, brings uh, today's uh, session to an end. Seeing a number of motions to adjourn, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>